Good morning. This hearing will come to order. Without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare a recess of the Committee at any time. Without objection, so ordered. The Oversight Committee exists to, to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes for them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers, because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. It is our job to work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. Today we meet to see, to, uh, today's hearing is, in fact, critical to our core oversight responsibility. The Environmental Pr Protection Agency is a massive Federal bureaucracy that employs thousands of people and regulates approximately 11 percent of the economy directly, but its impact on energy effectively regulates the prospect for competitiveness of our entire economy. It is an agency with far-reaching influence impacting the largest and the smallest corporations in America. While the vast majority of EPA employees are honest and follow the rules, a troubling trend has emerged, a lack of overall supervision and accountability for those employees who cheat the taxpayers. Let us consider some examples. For years, the top EPA official masqueraded as a secret agent, can't write this in a script, as a secret agent, a CIA man, while running up bogus vacations, charges on uh, and, and bogus vacations and other charges, airline tickets and the like, on taxpayers. In order to do that, he had to have the willing cooperation of many people, including the EPA administrator herself. Another top former EPA official received a discount on a new Mercedes worth thousands of dollars from a lobbyist with business before the EPA. EPA employees have been found watching mind-boggling amounts of pornography while in the office. EPA supervisors signed off on clearly fraudulent time claims for years. And I repeat, EPA supervisors knowingly signed off on timesheets for people they knew could not work, did not work, and in fact never even logged into their computers. Critical evidence about possible employee wrongdoing often goes missing, and investigators lack the necessary cooperation and, in fact, find a hostile environment when they try to do their job. Even top EPA leadership has in too many cases demonstrated a willingness to turn a blind eye to egregious wrongdoing rather than confront the problem. I appreciate the Administrator appearing here today to discuss the Committee's concerns. We are already dealing with one agency, the IRS, that has suffered a devastating loss of confidence from the Ameri of, the, of and from the American people. My fear is the EPA, without major changes, and those changes include how supervisors deal with responsibility for the, the money and the uh, uh, core rights of the American people will suffer a similar loss of confidence that hinders their ability to carry out their mission. I am also concerned that these problems which the Committee has detailed in numerous letters and hearings are not being related to top officials with whom the responsibility ultimately lies. Just last week, under oath in a transcribed interview with our staff, an EPA top congressional affairs person told us that not all letters sent by members or even committee chairmen and ranking members actually are seen by the administrator herself. It is troubling to me that, the well, <clears throat> that with the well-documented concerns raised by this committee and others may not even reach the eyes and ears of the person who, in fact, was nominated by the President and confirmed to have that responsibility. 
if problems known by this committee cannot reach the person with the statutory authority, then clearly there is a problem at the very top. Moreover, <clears throat> moreover the more we learn about the internal workings of the EPA, the more it needs oversight and an abundance of it. Our committee is not the only watchdog that has faced obstruction tactics from employees of the EPA. At a hearing last month, the Office of Inspector General described the dysfunctional relationship they are experiencing with the EPA's Office of Homeland Security. And I want to make sure I say this correctly. The EPA's Office of Homeland Security has absolutely no statutory relationship with Homeland Security, and in, in fact is a creation within the EPA that does not have statutory authority in any way, shape, or form that exceeds or preempts the Inspector General's office. And yet, Homeland Security has disrupted and prevented the IG from fully investigating employee malfeasance at the agency. The administrator, in response, sent a letter to the Office of Inspector General that further complicates the relationship between the offices and allows the Office of Homeland Security to continue conducting investigations without OIG involvement. They don't have the statutory authority, they will not quit, and the administrator herself has blessed the reduction in the lawful rights and responsibility of her own Inspector General. With or without the Administrator's knowledge, the EPA has continued to obstruct congressional investigation by refusing to provide subpoenaed documents. During a hearing last month, I made a very simple request to Deputy Administrator Bob Principi. With respect to a subpoena I served to you, Administrator McCarthy, in November of 2013, comply with it. The failure to comply has illustrated an apparent disregard for congressional oversight and an unwillingness to accept responsibility for the problems currently plaguing the EPA. As chairman of this committee, I intend to use every tool at my disposal to ensure that accountability and credibility is restored. Administrator, Administrator McCarthy, you are here to tell us what the EPA can and should be doing to aid in this effort and prevent the waste, fraud, and abuse that threaten the agency's reputation. Additionally, we are joined today, and I am very pleased to be joined, by Senator Vitter and Senator Whitehouse. We welcome them today, and we look forward to their testimony. And uh, we are going to run just a short video uh, to, uh, to kick this off. I, I know Senator Whitehouse has one, too. My patience has expired. Okay. I want full cooperation and discovery and delivery of all relevant documents, and I will be asking that you certify in a letter, signed letter, that you believe you have fully complied and that you do so within one month total. It is my intention to bring to this committee a contempt if that is not done. Okay. It is necessary because running the clock is going on. Well, first of all, thank you. And um, I understand what you just said. And my understanding is there is dialogue on going with the staff, but I will obviously go back and, and, and push ahead. Some of your employees in working with the staff have asserted that there may be an executive privilege Okay. claim in the case of documents. We have recently seen White House documents as to the false and misleading statements after Benghazi about uh, uh, the, uh, the video that wasn't a factor at all but was being led. It is the intent of the Speaker clearly that documents that are appropriate, even if they go to the White House, are discoverable, such as those. In this case, these are documents that you will have to assert and provide a privilege log if one exists. 
otherwise we expect full discovery and we cannot accept we may on some have executive privilege. Document by document, the President must assert executive privilege. He is not reluctant to do it, but we expect him to do it or we expect discovery. So I want to make it clear, these, you know, working with staff is a discussion. Producing or document by document claiming executive privilege is, in fact, something that the President has to decide with the Administrator. Member, Mr. Cummings, for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to remind everyone that this is our watch. We are on the earth today. The question is whether we will guard our environment so that when our children's children's children inherit it, it will be a better environment than the one that was in existence when we lived upon this earth. Mr. Chairman, today's hearing is significant because it marks the first time that the Administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency, Ms. McCarthy, will testify before any committee of Congress since the EPA issued its proposed rule to limit carbon pollution from power plants. The rule, which is part of the President's Climate Action Plan, is a landmark step towards addressing climate change. The time for our nation to take action on climate change is now, is right now, not tomorrow, not next week, but now. The science is abundantly clear and the evidence is simply overwhelming. This is our watch. So I welcome Administrator McCarthy, and I look forward to hearing from more about the agency's action on this very critical issue. I also welcome Senator Whitehouse and Senator Vitter. It is good to have you both here today. Just last week, Senator Whitehouse, who chairs the Senate Subcommittee on Clean Air and Nuclear Safety, held a remarkable hearing with testimony from our previous, four previous EPA administrators. They were all appointed by Republican Presidents. Let me say that again. They were all appointed by Republican pre Presidents. And they all, all four of them, testified about the urgent need for the United States to take, to act on climate change right now. Not tomorrow, not next year, now. These four Republican administrators wrote an op-ed in the New York Times on August 1, 2013, and let me tell you what they said. I didn't say this, they said it. And I quote, each of us took turns over the past 43 years running the Environmental Protection Agency. We served Republican presidents, but we have a message that transcends political affiliation. The United States must move now on substantive steps to curb climate change at home and internationally. End of quote. These four Republican administrators endorsed President Obama's climate action plan, and here is what they also wrote. A market-based approach, like a carbon tax, would be the best path to reducing greenhouse gas emissions but that is unachievable in the current political gridlock in Washington. Dealing with this political reality, President Obama's June Climate Action Plan lays out achievable actions 
that would deliver real progress. End of quote. This is our watch. These words came from officials who served in the Nixon administration, the Reagan administrations, and both Bush administrations. But the question is, is Congress listening? Are we listening? Are we hearing their urgent warnings? Unfortunately, it appears that the answer is no. Republicans have designated this week in the House of Representatives as, quote, Energy Week, end of quote. Yet they refuse to consider any legislation to address climate change. This is our watch. Instead, they will vote over and over and over and over again to protect the interests of the fossil fuel industry. This is our watch. We have a duty to pass on a cleaner environment than the one we found when we came upon this earth. As a result, this week, the House of Representatives will take its 500th anti-environment vote since Republicans took the majority in the 112th Congress. Unfortunately, the actions of this committee seem to reflect the same priorities. The official purpose of today's hearing is not to address climate change or the response of federal agencies to one of the most enormous challenges facing our nation and our entire world. Instead, the committee will focus on what appears to be an effort to block EPA at every turn and to prevent the agency from getting anything done. Since 2011, Chairman Issa has launched an unprecedented 18 separate investigations into EPA activities. He has sent 49 letters, issued two subpoenas, and held 15 hearings, including this one. Today, some committee members will accuse Administrator McCarthy of obstructing congressional oversight. But the facts show this simply is not true. The EPA employees have testified in more than a dozen hearings. They have participated in numerous transcribed interviews, depositions, and briefings. And they have produced more than 200,000 pages of documents to the committee since 2011. This is our watch. And so I want to be clear that some of these investigations are worthwhile. The actions by John Beale, for example, of pretending to be a CIA agent while working at the EPA are criminal. And they deserve to be investigated and prosecuted, and he should be brought to justice. But eventually, I believe the committee must turn from oversight to reform, because this is our watch. At some point, History calls on us to take on the greatest challenge of our generation, the greatest challenge our generation has ever faced in global warning. Ladies and gentlemen, we simply do not have the right to remain silent. Mr. Chairman, you said in your opening that the EPA regulates businesses and affects the economy. I don't think you mentioned its core mission its core mission, to protect the human health and the environment. I just wanted to make that clear. And finally, EPA must fulfill its mission of protecting human health and our environment. And Congress should do everything in our power during our watch to make sure that they have the resources and the tools necessary to do so. And with that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. As we go to our witnesses, I might 
remind the witnesses that the hearing has been designated as management failures oversight of the EPA, which is within our jurisdiction, not global warming. Members may have seven days to submit opening statements for the record. We now welcome our distinguished first panel. As is the usual practice of the committee, the Senators will be excused immediately following the testimony and will not be sworn. The Honorable David Vitter from Louisiana is the ranking member of the Senate Committee on Environmental and Public Works and has been highly involved in the oversight process uh, with this committee. The Honorable Sheldon Whitehouse from Rhode Island is a member of the Senate Committee on Environment and Public Works. Senator Whitehouse, uh, I think you won the straw. You get to go first. Thank you, Chairman, Ranking Member Cummings. The Environmental Protection Agency is far more popular than Congress, and its mission to protect human health and the environment is one of the most fundamental and popular responsibilities of the Federal Government. Bad actors, like John Beal, can be found in large institutions and should be dealt with by the proper authorities. But we don't, in America, impugn the integrity of an entire agency and its thousands of public servants. That is a disservice to the American people who rely on the EPA to protect public health. Earlier this month, EPA used its Clean Air Act authority, as established by Congress and affirmed by the Supreme Court, to propose carbon pollution standards for the country's existing power plants. The approach taken in the standards was based on unprecedented public engagement. EPA held more than 300 public meetings, working with stakeholders of all kinds and all across the political spectrum. EPA has put states in the driver's seat to come up with their own best plan to meet state-specific targets. States and power companies will have a wide variety of options to achieve carbon reductions, like boosting renewable energy, establishing energy savings targets, investing in efficiency, or joining one of the existing cap-and-trade programs, each of which strategies has been proven successful in our states. States can develop plans that create jobs, plans that cut electricity costs by boosting efficiency, plans that achieve major pollution reduction. As proposed, the rule will reduce carbon pollution while providing as much as $93 billion in public benefit per year by 2030. A recent Washington Post-ABC News poll found that 70 percent of the public supports Federal standards to limit greenhouse gas pollution. And just last week, The Wall Street Journal and NBC News released a poll showing that two-thirds of Americans support President Obama's new carbon pollution standard. More than half say the U.S. should address climate change even if it means higher electricity bills for them. EPA's proposal is also supported by major utilities like National Grid faith organizations like the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, and nameplate corporations like Mars, Nike, Starbucks, and countless others. As the ranking member indicated, four former EPA administrators who served under Presidents Nixon, Reagan, George H. W. Bush, and George W. Bush testified recently before my Senate Environment Public Works Subcommittee on Clean Air and Nuclear Safety. They explained that carbon pollution needs to be addressed immediately that EPA's rule is a reasonable way to reduce carbon pollution, and that industry has a history of developing innovative ways to comply with environmental regulations in ways that cost significantly less than industry's initial estimates. Indeed, some say that those initial estimates are often exaggerated. The Clean Air Act, according to a 2011 EPA assessment, will benefit Americans by will benefit Americans more than its costs by a ratio of 30 to 1, $30 of value in the lives of regular Americans for every $1 the polluters had to pay in cleanup costs. That is a good deal for America. I am grateful to Administrator McCarthy for working diligently to do 
what Congress and the Supreme Court told EPA to do and what the American people want EPA to do to reduce harmful carbon pollution in accordance with the law and the vast preponderance of the best available science. Whatever questions may need to be answered, it does not serve the public to interfere with the EPA in its performance of this vital, popular, and beneficial task. Indeed, it would be a dereliction of duty on, as the Ranking Member said, our watch. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ranking Member Cummings. Thank you, Senator Whitehouse. And now, uh, Senator Vitter, we uh, look forward to your comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Cummings and all members for inviting me to testify before your committee today. And uh, I'm going to break from the previous two speakers. I'm going to actually talk about the topic of this hearing entitled, quote, Management Failures, Oversight of the EPA, close quote. As a Ranking Member of the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee, I have a responsibility to oversee the EPA. Unfortunately, under the current majority in the Senate, our committee has yet to hold a single oversight hearing on this important matter, contending instead that a perfunctory member's briefing was sufficient. That is why your work and your effort is so incredibly important. Now, while there are certainly serious policy debates about the agency and its role in regulating our energy supply, that is not what I am here to discuss. That is not what the hearing is about. Rather, my testimony will focus on my work over the last year that has uncovered what appears to be a systematic breakdown in EPA operations that have wasted millions of taxpayer dollars. Now, at the very beginning, let me emphasize three key points. First of all, I am not saying I have never said that all or most EPA employees or dishonest or incompetent. I have never said that, and I have never impugned their integrity. And secondly, I have never said that these problems started uh, under this administration and existed under this administration alone. I have never said that. I am not saying that today. But number three, the statement by others, including the head of the EPA, that John Beale was a lone wolf and a completely isolated incident is clearly not true, and the facts clearly contradict that. Uh, the Beale saga has uncovered major systemic management failures at EPA and has also led to the uncovering of other significant time and attendance fraud, other unrelated cases that you have heard about including in your May 7th hearing. Let me give you the history of my work on this matter. In July 2013, I was contacted by a whistleblower who described serious and systemic time and attendance fraud at the EPA. Some of these problems involved situations where senior EPA managers discouraged remedial action against chronic offenders because it was easier to ignore the, the problem than to fix it. Based on this information, I requested EPA's Office of Inspector General to brief me on the time and attendance problems they were investigating at the agency. I was expecting an account of the instances reported by the whistleblower, but instead I learned of another case, the bizarre tale of John Beale, the fake CIA agent who pled the fifth in this hearing room. When we made the Beale saga public, I was aware of the underlying symptoms of abuse going on at the agency. Therefore, it was immediately apparent to me that the agency's claim that Beale was a lone wolf or an isolated case was just flat out completely false. And anybody who argued that he was a solo actor was just flat out distorting the truth. Since then, I have been focused on uncovering the circumstances and management weaknesses that allowed Beale's fraud to continue for so long, literally for decades. These management failures have facilitated wasting millions upon millions of taxpayer dollars and undermined congressional oversight. In August 2013, I requested the OIG to immediately launch an investigation into the agency's policies and process that facilitated Beale's fraud and to make recommendations to ensure this never happens again. 
when the OIG issued its report in December 2013 on Beale's travel and pay issues, the findings were, in my opinion, rather scant, scant and prompted more questions, such as who knew or should have known what Beale was up to, and when did they first have reason to believe that Beale was defrauding the agency. So I asked the OIG to show me their work. My staff then poured through all of the OIG's documents and interview notes in hopes of answering these key questions. The results of our review were the subject of a series of reports issued in February and March of this year, which are attached to my testimony today. The key findings of these reports include, one, Beale could not have accomplished his massive fraud without assistance, knowingly or unknowingly, from former and current EPA officials who have in no way been held accountable. Two, one of the key facilitators of Beale's fraud was Deputy Administrator Perciuseppe, who signed key documents and contributed to the delay in reporting Beale to the OIG. Three, the timeline offered by the EPA and the OIG that concluded Administrator McCarthy, McCarthy was the first person to report suspicions of Beale is highly suspect. And four, other EPA employees had an opportunity to be proactive and should have done more to prevent the fraud, but chose to defer to senior officials rather than report their concerns to the OIG. Now, as I said at the beginning, and I want to emphasize, Beale's fraud stretched through several administrations, Republican and Democrat. And, that's, and so it's easy to second guess their actions with the benefit of hindsight, but this does not change the fact that many individuals at EPA had knowledge or were, were willfully ignorant of Beale's ongoing fraud. These individuals have never been held accountable. I also emphasize that certainly most EPA employees are not bad apples, are not incompetent, are not defrauding the public. They are dedicated public servants. However, when an agency is in the process of aggressively expanding its jurisdiction, regulating something as significant as our energy supply, they have a key responsibility to make sure that their own house is in order, and EPA's is clearly not. Aside from the Beale case, I have learned more about the dysfunction of the EPA, again, thanks to courageous whistleblowers. And this has made it abundantly clear, again, that John Beal was not a lone wolf and his case is not an isolated instance. You heard of, about other significant cases of time and attendance fraud at your May 7th hearing. In addition, a whistleblower has informed my staff that there was a dispute between the Office of Homeland Security and the OIG. When I learned of the dispute, I was immediately struck by the coincidence that the same actors who delayed providing the OIG with critical information about Beale were the same individuals involved in an altercation with an OIG investigator. We now know there are additional instances where EPA employees refused to cooperate with OIG investigations and received no reprimand. And I understand that as recently as yesterday, this issue is completely unresolved in, in the eyes of the OIG. Because of our joint efforts, a veil has been pulled back, revealing that wasted taxpayer resources and mismanagement permeates the agency. Given that much of our efforts to uncover waste, fraud, and abuse at the agency derive from the voice of undaunted whistleblowers, I encourage additional concerned EPA staff to come forward at any juncture. We can work together to reform and rehabilitate the troubled agency. As my testimony today demonstrates, representatives in Congress do listen and do take action based on information whistleblowers provide. In closing, I want to commend this committee for taking the issue of waste, fraud, and abuse at the EPA seriously and for holding today's hearing. Uh, it is important that this story come out, and because of your work, additional stories of this systematic problem have come out, and it has demonstrated that John Beale and his crimes were just, unfortunately, the tip of the iceberg. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Senator. We appreciate your coming here to give us a testimony. And once again, I want to thank you for your entire team's effort in this joint investigation. We will now take a very short recess in place for the administrator to be seated. Would you please change the, uh, the names? Our second panel today is Administrator of the United States Environmental Protection Agency, the Honorable Gina McCarthy. Pursuant to the committee rules, uh, Madam Administrator, would you please rise to take the oath? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you very much. Please be seated. As you, you know, after so long doing this job as a deputy and as the administrator, uh, your entire uh, prepared statement will be on the record. You may choose to read it or use your five minutes in any way you choose. The gentlelady is recognized. Thank you very much, Chairman Issa, uh, Ranking Member Cummings and members of the committee. I, I appreciate the opportunity to testify today. The EPA's mission is to protect public health and the environment, and it is important to every one of us, and I understand and appreciate this committee's keen interest in the EPA's work. In order to best achieve EPA's mission, one of the themes for my tenure as Administrator has been to embrace EPA as a high-performing organization. This means using our limited resources effectively so that EPA employees have the tools they need to do the important work that we ask of them every day. Effective oversight is an important assurance that the agency's work remains faithful to its mission and its mandates. In support of congressional oversight, the EPA works daily to respond to letters and various requests for information from this committee and others. Over the last six months, the EPA has produced thousands of documents, tens of thousands of pages, to this committee alone. Cooperation with our overseers is not just EPA's policy, but it has and it has always been part of EPA's culture. EPA employees have always provided extensive information and support to facilitate the oversight work of EPA's Inspector General. The Inspector General plays a special role in helping me to ensure that the agency is operating at its best, and I, along with my entire leadership team, remain committed to supporting the important work of that office. The responsible and accurate reporting of time and attendance agency-wide has been a significant focus for both the EPA as well as our Inspector General. Through investigations of the conduct of John Beale, the former EPA employee who defrauded the agency and is now serving time in jail, we identified several weaknesses in agency systems that allowed that fraud to occur and persist. Based on those findings, EPA has taken extensive steps to ensure this type of fraud cannot be repeated. It is also important to note that even though John Beale has been criminally prosecuted and is currently serving time in jail, the agency continues to seek restitution for the fraud that he perpetrated. In addition to the $1.4 million already recovered from, from Mr. Beale during the criminal process, the agency is seeking to recover costs related to unwarranted retention incentives and fraudulent travel costs, and we are working to lower his retirement annuity. Eliminating waste, fraud and abuse is critically important to me for two reasons. First, as Administrator, I believe it is my obligation to provide the leadership and stewardship needed to ensure the kind of organization that the public servants at EPA deserve. And second, because of the work at EPA is so important, the health and environmental protections we administer benefit every person in the United States. We do this work with public trust and public resources, and we simply cannot afford to fail. Nowhere is that more true than on our work to address climate change. Climate change is one of the greatest challenges that we face. The science is clear, the risks are clear, 
and the high costs of climate inaction are clear. We must act, which is why President Obama laid out a climate action plan and why on June 2nd I signed the proposed Clean Power Plan to cut carbon pollution, build a more resilient nation, and lead the world in our global climate fight. EPA's proposed Clean Power Plan is a critical step forward. It will cut hundreds of millions of tons of carbon pollution and hundreds of thousands of tons of other harmful air pollutants. Together, these reductions will provide important health benefits to our most vulnerable citizens, including our children. All told, in 2030, when States meet their individual goals through their own flexible uh, compliance path, our proposal will result in a 30 percent uh, reduction in carbon pollution compared to our levels in 2005. In 2030, the Clean Carbon Plan, the Clean Power Plan, will deliver climate and health benefits of up to $90 billion. And because energy efficiency is such a smart, cost-effective strategy, we predict that in 2030, average electricity bills for American families will actually be 8 percent cheaper. This is the kind of remarkable progress we can make when, when we have forward-looking policy when we have engaged stakeholders, and when EPA is a high-performing, high-functioning agency. And I look forward to answering the questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Before I ask my round of questioning, uh, your, your assistant was asked this question more than 30 days ago. I made it clear you were in the back, hopefully you saw the video, uh, that I would hold you in contempt if I did not receive one of the two events within 30 days, either compliance with the November 2013 uh, subpoena lawfully served on you, or item by item privilege logs uh, claiming executive privilege from the President. Are you prepared to deliver those documents here today? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, EPA remains interested in working with the committee on the accommodation we have put forward. That is a yes or no. I am answering the question, sir. No, ma'am. You are talking about the same things you did in the opening statement. You are talking about your commitment to comply. I will let you answer fully, but I caution you. You have been threatened with contempt for not complying with a subpoena from November of 2013. Your deputy was warned. You are back here today because, in fact, no compliance with this has happened and no executive privilege has been claimed and no log has been produced. So I ask you again, are you prepared today to deliver the documents consistent with the subpoena of November 7, 2013? Mr. Chairman, it is my understanding that the staff have, have had discussions as early as just a short time ago about this issue. You know we have worked hard to recognize the interests of this committee in ensuring that there is no White House interference in the work between us in delivering documents that you require. We have provided an accommodation which we actually shared with your staff this morning, and we are looking to make sure that that addresses your needs so that we can avoid institution problems with, with the request that you made and hopefully move on to continue our work together. Ma'am. This morning, an in-camera review of a document we knew existed, demanded, was, was shown. It changes nothing. The subpoena calls for you to deliver the document and documents. You have not done so. Are you prepared not to negotiate with minority staff or majority staff? Are you prepared to deliver the documents or provide an item-by-item privilege log with an executive privilege? Mr. Chairman, EPA has made no decision to not, not work with you on this issue. In fact, we have been trying very hard to do just that, which we know is our responsibility. Could you imagine if I just went ahead and set up a, a coal energy plant without a permit and started burning raw coal to produce electricity and then told you for month after month after month that I look forward to working with you? The fact is, this was a lawfully served subpoena. I am informing you today that it is my intention to hold the Environmental Protection Agency in contempt and to schedule a business meeting to do so at the first business day available to this committee, which will be after next week. Uh, 
Mr. Chairman, I think our accommodation addressed the interests of the committee. I would like to just make sure that we can continue these discussions and get a final look at that document. The minority staff have looked the, at it. I, I, now I, the, the minority, staff. the President of the United States said elections have consequences. During the minority's time in the majority under President Obama, no oversight was done. This is my watch. This is my time. Elections have consequences. You have not complied with a subpoena. I am telling you the time to comply is now. If it is not complied with, I will today schedule a business meeting. I will hold that business meeting. This committee will consider and vote on contempt at that business meeting unless we have full compliance by that time. And, ma'am, there is no negotiation. Negotiation time has expired long ago. It is contemptible for months to pass and have you say that you are negotiating. That in-camera offer, quite frankly, was insufficient. We accepted I'm sorry, it. Mr. Chairman, I didn't say I was negotiating. What I'm trying to indicate is I, I certainly respect the important interests that your committee has put on the table that led to that subpoena being issued. You were very clear. I am trying to indicate that there is clear documentation that there was no White House interference. And if that can be agreed, then I think we can all agree that the important institutional considerations at, at, at EPA and of the executive branch should also be considered and hopefully resolved through this process. Ma'am, I appreciate that. It is not clear that there was no White House interference. And so your, your statement is, in fact, your position. It is not clear. So we will have no preconditions that there was no White House interference. There was a large office at the White House that was formed to, in fact, handle it. The legislative liaisons that we deal with every day work for the White House more than they work for you, and that is true of all the Cabinet positions. So I, I want to get past that. Obviously, we are not going to see those documents today. And, uh, Does the uh, ranking member have any comment on yeah, the? I do. Oh, I do. Please. Um, in all fairness, I just want to make sure. So, so I understand the chairman is saying uh, no negotiations, and you said you understand that. Um, why, why don't we have the documents today? Why don't we? I mean, you—they were available in camera. Is that right? Well, actually, you. Well, I mean, hold on. Let, let me. Let me. I'm asking her. The, the entire request that started this process and raised concerns, all of those documents have been provided to the committee. The question that, that we were, was raised to us re was related to a separate email exchange between EPA and the White House. We have certainly shared that in camera with now both sides of the committee. And that clearly shows there was no White House intervention. And that was the sole reason for the subpoena which requires five years of, of uh, uh, I any communication between the executive branch, the executive office of the President, and EPA relative to any congressional inquiries, which to me is a very large task, significant taxpayer dollars. And if we have accommodated this request by showing that the reason the concern was raised is no longer justified or appropriate, and we have addressed that concern, we see no reason why we would want to expend significant taxpayer dollars on that search. Well, obviously, the chairman doesn't feel the same way you feel. Is that right? I yield to the chairman. Uh, you, don't, you don't agree with what she just said? The in-camera document indicated I left you a voicemail. That is certainly not something we can further verify. Uh, and this investigation has everything to do with White House, in, in White House interference with the discovery process. When we issue a subpoena, the 106 documents that we became aware of because of a whistleblower, when we, when we issue a subpoena to then go into a series of negotiations, what is going to be redacted and so on, with people at the White House is, in fact, now part of the subpoena request. We are requesting the communications that went into the production. Now, if the President wishes to say that every time he micromanages whether we get our documents pursuant to our oversight and he wants to claim an executive privilege, he may do so. Mr. Chairman, this is the, a longstanding practice. Ma'am, ma practices happy. are written in the Constitution. 
you do not there is no precedent for this and quite frankly the longstanding practice that you speak of is a longstanding practice that i inherited because for 2 years the minority when they were in the majority did no oversight my first subpoena i'm sorry my first yeah my first request for documents was greeted with a please please submit a foia as though we were the public or a newspaper and had no further constitutional oversight. So we have issued a subpoena. It has been lawfully issued. It has been out there for a long time. My folks want to get to other questions as to your failure to manage well, those Mr. limited Chairman, resources. Than, so I would like to get past it. Mr. Cummings, yeah, do you have I just, and I was about to say something. And then, I was just going to say, I am more than happy if, if the, the concern is that we just showed it to you and didn't provide it. I am more than happy to provide this email if that addresses the, the accommodation that we need to protect both of our institutional considerations. You certainly could make an in-camera presentation of all the emails, all of them, and that would allow for staff to fully evaluate whether or not the production of all of the emails or some of the emails would be necessary. One chosen email is not, in fact, sufficient to take care of it. There has been multiple correspondence. I will never get the voicemail left, but I certainly am entitled for my staff to look at all the correspondence with the White House related to the production of these 106 documents. If that can be done, then we can make an evaluation. We can't do it based on one selected document. I'm well, sure you understand. Well, it's just my understanding that this was the document that raised the, the committee's concern. No, ma'am. This was the document that we had an advanced copy of that we knew existed that we, we asked for because we found out it existed because of a whistleblower. The fact is there are many more. We want all the documents that exist. Now, if there has been hard drive crashes, laptop disappearances or other failures or losses, we also want to know about those immediately since, pursuant to the subpoena, there was a requirement to preserve documents. And we have done a lot of that this week. With that, uh, one, one last thing. Of course. It is my understanding that your staff offered to uh, months ago to show these documents to the majority staff, and what happened? Do you know? Uh, they did not take us up on that offer, sir. Um, and it, the, the concern I have is, is obvious. Um, there are uh, balance of power issues here. Um, I am trying to address the issue that was raised to us that raised concern. If this is a larger concern than EPA, I doubt that any production we can provide you would quell that concern. Um, and I think there are legitimate issues that the Constitution recognizes on balance of power and the appropriation we have offered is what we are supposed to do um, and what we are supposed to have a, a good discussion about and try to reach an accommodation to not tip the balance there, because we believe that, that uh, uh, we need to have confidential communications with the White House in a way that allows us to be efficient and effective. I appreciate this would that. Well that. My staff indicates that no such offer to see all the documents was ever given. I'm sorry. It, you, it, let me clarify. The, the offer was to show you the document you indicated that raised your concern. Not 106. Right. And that document raises more questions than answers, and it was, on, it was only shown today in camera. I asked for them to look at it in camera, but we never presuppose that we see one document, and if it raises more questions than answers, we won't want to see more. Uh, you know, you're in, uh, and I'm going to go to the ranking member and let him ask his questions. But the fact is, Madam Administrator, your entire power base, everything you do, is in fact a power of the House and Senate that has been essentially loaned to the executive branch. The decision to decide a new ruling on any part of clean air or clean water, to grant permits, these are all powers of law. So I appreciate you are talking about balance of power, but you only exist because a power of, of this branch has been loaned to the executive branch. It is, you know, EPA is not an inherent power of the second article branch. But I am going to take a break and not ask my own line of questioning yet. Mr. Cummings, please ask yours. Thank you very much. Uh, Administrator McCarthy, I want to pick up on this. Uh, now, I have listened to the Chairman, and I simply disagree with his characterization, but I, I do not believe you are obstructing anything. I, I do not believe there is a 
conspiracy with the White House. I believe that the EPA has been responsive. And you have produced more than 208,000 pages of documents, and the agency has been trying in good faith to cooperate in all 18 of the committee investigations. However, I would like to give you a chance again to respond to any question you may not have been able to fully address. Would you like to raise any additional points? Well, the, the only thing I would like to mention is that, is that uh, this issue arose um, significantly uh, through an earlier uh, request for information. We spent considerable time and effort to respond to a variety of information requests that were made of us. Um, the, these 106 emails were produced within seven days of us receiving the subpoena. The one issue that, that is outstanding was the, was the committee's concern about whether or not there was a White House intervention on the basis of this one email exchange, which we have now shown the staff. And so we think this should alleviate the, the, uh, the concern and allow us to get to our operation, our business at hand. And if we do that, we work very hard with this committee. We take every request seriously. We work with staff to prioritize as best we can so we meet the most immediate needs. We have produced hundreds of thousands of pages of information. Um, over the past few years, and I think we will continue to try to do that as best we can and hopefully work through with the committee through this process as well. All right. Well, thank you. With that, I, I want to ask you about a much more important issue. As we heard la uh, last week, uh, Senator Whitehouse held an amazing hearing with uh, four of your predecessors, uh, all Republican administrators, testifying about climate change. They all agreed that our nation needs to act now. Uh, one former administrator, uh, William Rucklesaus, was appointed by President Nixon. He said this, and I quote, the four former EPA administrators sitting in front of you found that we were convinced by the overwhelming verdict of scientists that the Earth was warming and that the humans were the only controllable contributor to that phenomenon, end of quote. Mr. McCarthy, how significant is it that all of the administrators came together to advocate for, a, for action on climate change? I think, it, I think it's very significant, sir. And I, I also uh, am not surprised by it, frankly, because the science has been clear for quite some time. Uh, I think the, the best thing about it was in, in hopes of getting uh, partisan politics out of the science debate um, and moving forward to take a look at actions. Clearly, Republicans were some of the first conservationists uh, in, in the U.S. We had Teddy Roosevelt that created the National Park System. President Nixon is actually the father of EPA. The first President Bush actually signed uh, the Clean Air Act amendments. And so we have worked together for years to find out how we can preserve and protect uh, both public health and the natural resources and continue to grow the economy. We are going to do exactly the same with the challenge of carbon pollution and climate change. And indeed, the time is now to take action. And the best part of the action, sir, is that they will benefit the economy. They will spark American innovation. They will continue to keep us in a leadership position on clean energy. And I am very much looking forward to having this discussion on our comment period of the proposal we released a few weeks ago. Now, all four of these Republican administrators endorsed the President's climate action plan. They, they said, and I quote, uh, President Obama's June climate action plan lays out achievable actions that would, would deliver real progress. Your proposed rule has also received praise from State governors, for example, Rhode Island Governor Lincoln Chafee said this, and I quote, thank you to the President of the EPA and the, and the EPA for taking the step forward to reduce pollution from power plants, which nationally is a large source of carbon emissions. Why is it that states in particular favor the approach uh, you have taken in the proposed rule, and what work have you done? with States to ensure that their concerns are addressed? 
Well, as many of you may know, I actually worked for state government for a number of years under both republic actually mostly Republican administrations. Um, and so when we started down this venture of, of trying to respond to the commitment that the President uh, asked us to fulfill for the American public, which is to develop uh, rules for existing power plants. Um, we actually did unprecedented outreach. We spent considerable amount of time with the states. And as a result, we have a proposal that is as respectful of states as it possibly can. It has maximum flexibility and actually sets standards for those states that are practical and affordable and achievable, but it allows them to create their own path forward so that it is done in a way that is most respectful of their own economies and their own energy needs and where they are today and what they can do moving forward. Uh, so I am excited about, about moving forward with this. We are going to continue that spirit of outreach during this 120-day comment period, and we will continue to work with states who are our greatest ally um, in bringing these carbon pollution reductions to the table and ensuring that our communities stay safe and our public is protected. Chairman, just one more question. Another Republican former Bush administration Treasury Secretary, Hank Paulson, wrote an op-ed this week asserting that the climate crisis we now face rivals the global economic crisis of 2008. He said this, and quote, this is a crisis we can't afford to ignore. I feel as if I am watching as we fly in slow motion on a collision course toward a, toward a giant mountain. We can see the crash coming, and yet we are sitting on our hands rather than altering our course. He went on to say we need to act now, even though there is much disagreement including from members of my own Republican Party, we must not lose sight of the profound economic risks of doing nothing. And so my last question, Ms. McCarthy, is uh, his argument to his Republican colleagues is that the economic costs of inaction far outweigh the costs of acting now. Uh, do you agree with that? I do, sir. And, and President Obama, I think, was very wise in developing this comprehensive plan and bringing together the entire administration. He know, knew that, that climate change wasn't just an environmental issue. It is a significant economic issue for this country that we need to face, as well as a national security challenge. And when this, this body is asked to figure out how to pay $110 billion in costs associated with national disasters in 2012 alone that is not accommodated through the budget process, then we have a problem here that we need to address. And the great thing is we can do it in actions that are actually going to grow the economy and keep our communities safer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Administrator, uh, if you will put up the IG statement. Uh, we, uh, we received an email after this attempt, supposed attempt to accommodate the IG. Uh, in a nutshell, your IG, in fact, the continued use of your Office of Homeland Security undermines the Office of Inspector General, statutorily responsible to both this body and to the President. Will you commit today to fully Job and cease having this investigative process going on by your Homeland Security, the Office of Homeland Security. Mr. Chairman, uh, it, I listened very closely to the hearing earlier that you had on this, and I, and I thank you for that. Um, it became very clear that I needed to intervene personally on this issue, and I have. Since you last uh, met on this issue, we have made tremendous progress. We actually have staff in the OIG and OHS working together. The memo that he is talking about is our first step forward in this process. Ma'am, the letter, the email from the Inspector General says the progress has not been made. The Homeland Security, this creation of your, your your, uh, Actually, I am not sure that is what that said, sir. We have made tremendous progress, but clearly we have not completely it, it, resolved okay. all of our well, issues. Well, look, nothing has changed to me means nothing has changed, and that is what it says. Here is the problem, Administrator. You cannot, in my understanding, have failures, particularly human resource failures, abuse, abusive work environment, mm -hmm. uh, sexual harassment, fraud. You cannot have it investigated by your Homeland Security people who work for you. The IG exists to be independent. Now, if you choose to have some, in, in, uh, some of your own investigations going on, 
I can't take away your ability to do it. I can tell you that taking away the IG's authority right. or in any way having the IG not know about it, which has been testified before this committee that under your watch that happens and happens regularly, including the Beal situation, where when you discovered that for years you had been duped, you had gone to lunch with Mr. Beal, he had been a pal of yours from all indications. This is somebody you regularly have optional meetings with. He fooled you. When you discovered after his supposed retirement and non-retirement that you and your agency had been fooled, and we are not holding you responsible for that kind of a failure. This, is, this, this man apparently was very good at his con work. He probably should have worked with CIA instead of the EPA. <laughs> but the fact is, when you discovered it, you did not immediately go to the IG. You went and did additional work. That policy flies in the face of the reason the IG Act was passed by Congress and signed by President. Mr. Chairman, I would do nothing to interfere with the ability of the OIG to do their jobs. The OIG actually requested that we take a look at defining roles and responsibilities between the o OIG and OHS. And if you look at the memo that, that, that uh, transported, that transferred this, this new process, we were trying to work these, these issues diligently together as one EPA, it will verify that I have strongly supported this. And my process changes are exactly to ensure that the OIG can do its job yeah, while the national comment security is in, issues are resolved. is related to the memo. So I guess we are going to ask the OIG to come back again, because he just doesn't agree with you. Well, we Let haven't had a chance to fully discuss it, Mr. Chairman. It was presented um, as a work in progress. It was presented to address some issues and not all. I am very confident that if you give us an did, ability to work on these issues, Did the Inspector General tell you that, did the Inspector General tell you when you gave him the memo that it was unacceptable? No, he told me it had not fully resolved his issues. I totally agreed with him, and okay, I understood well, that. Okay, well, we will consider those to be syn synonymous. Let me go through a couple of things. Do you remember Mr. Martin Townsend? Um, I, am f I do not know uh, Martin Townsend personally. I am familiar with his name, yes. Okay, and you know who Susan Strassman Sunday was? Uh, I do not know that, pers that person personally, no. Well, for many years, Martin Townsend falsely signed mm -hmm. and claimed that Susan Strassman Sunday was, in fact, working when she was in a nursing home. She wasn't working. Now, we can understand the, the, the sad situation that the, the Susan Strassman Sunday might be in. But what have you done to ensure that there is zero tolerance for falsifying and claiming any you say you have limited resources, these people were squandering your resources and doing so as a, as a practice that repeated itself. What have you done to make sure it never happens again? Uh, in, uh, in general, sir, um, we have taken steps to make sure that our time and attendance is handled differently so it can be better monitored. Um, we are also pursuing administrative action against Mr. Townsend and diligently pursuing that as well. We are trying to systematically make sure that our system is in place to catch these issues earlier and to work through these processes. I am very committed to making sure that, that waste, fraud and abuse is pursued as diligently as, as we can, and I have in no way tolerated uh, any lack of accountability or these types of issues. It, it is a disservice to the vast majority of people at my agency who work very okay. hard. And, and you realize hard. that uh, the IG's strongest point is, in fact, if you stay out of his way and let him do this, even if your Homeland Security people think that they should be doing the investigations. Uh, obviously, we could deal with the people who are on administrative leave being paid full time because of their addiction to pornography being too much for you to allow them to be on the job. Uh, I would hope that the, uh, uh, the EPA and other government agencies would try to come to us with a request for authority to more quickly sever people who uh, are so flagrantly uh, flaunting good judgment Anything in law. Anything that we can do to, to expedite these resolutions would be great. Um, Lastly, uh, although I chastised you and will continue to for your failure to comply with the November uh, subpoena, I want to thank you or thank your people uh, and have you ask, uh, on behalf of some cooperation we received on the Pebble Mine issue. It is clear, though, that as long as individuals who were part of the process 
that caused your agency to unilaterally attempt to preempt the application for a mine to comply with clean water, that we will, we will find it unacceptable. We have tried to serve a subpoena on, uh, on, uh, on your uh, former employee, and we have, we have uh, uh, asked for the failed hard drive from this Alaskan individual who now is in New Zealand and seems to never be returning. We might strongly suggest that without the, the underlying science that you use to support your unprecedented or nearly unprecedented preemption of somebody's ability to apply for a, a permit to your agency, that you reconsider and allow the application to go forward since the underlying science now is not just in question, it is unavailable. And if you would respond, and then we will go to the uh, Yeah, ju Just to make it clear, sir, I believe that, that uh, our uh, science assessment has been out in the public for quite some time. It was properly peer-reviewed a couple of times. But I would also uh, caution that, that the decision to move forward under 404C is not preempting that project from moving forward. It is creating a very public process to discuss this issue, and no decision has been made whatsoever as to whether or not EPA is going to utilize this authority under the Clean, Clean Water Act. Relative to the failed hard drive, I am happy to have our staff talk. I did not realize that that was being requested, but I am sure we can talk about that and work through these issues, as we have on the other issues. Yeah, we have new appreciation for failed hard drives. Uh, <laughs> I will say that since the people requested the 404 action before they did the science uh, to support their conclusion, and which they did the, the request for 404 before, that in fact that prejudging that they, it was not going to be ever able to happen is a little bit like somebody holding their finger in the air and, and, and saying, I understand there is a tornado coming. The tornado hasn't come but they are now asking us all to go to the shelters. The reality is that the documents indicate they made a decision and asked for the 404 and then did the science. I am sorry, sir. I okay. don't know who would have made that decision. We will we'll provide you is, the documents. My uh, understanding is that the petitions came in. EPA chose to do the science assessment before they responded to the petitions, and then the decision was made to yep. move yeah, together. Ranking member. Yes. Just a, fr a friendly uh, follow-up. It is probably one of the most important things that, to be answered here today that Chairman asked. And I just want to make sure we get a clear answer on this. Uh, the, the bill situation, what has been put in place to make sure, the Chairman asked that, but I didn't hear the answer, to make sure that doesn't happen again? Because I think every single member of this committee was very upset about it. I just want to know what now is in place to make sure somebody that isn't able to do an agency out of that kind of money for so long. Yeah, well, we have, yeah, put, you, we have sure. put in place, thank you for asking, uh, a number of significant uh, changes to the way in we look at time and attendance, the way in which we approve travel. We actually now have a system that we have switched to that is going to provide a hard stop for retention bonuses. We are requiring different levels of approval and requirements for approval of time and attendance. I am happy to provide a full documentation of all the steps we have taken to make sure that human error can happen and that managers don't have an ability and a responsibility to hold their, their employees accountable. Thank you. And I am delighted to call on the general, gentleman from Missouri who was here before the gavel, Mr. Clay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Administrator McCarthy, I want to ask about the case of John Bill a former senior policy advisor who worked for you when you were assistant administrator of EPA's Office of Air and Radiation. As you know, this man lied to his friends, family, and EPA colleagues for 13 years by claiming that he worked for the CIA in, the, in order to avoid doing work for the EPA and to steal time from the government. Mr. Bill got away with this for years under both Republican and Democratic administrations until you started the process of investigating his supposed CIA assignment. This man is now sitting in a Federal prison serving 32 months and has been required to pay nearly $1.4 million in restitution and forfeiture. 
uh, Mr. Bill claimed that he was able to deceive colleagues at the EPA because he earned their trust and respect over the years, and they did not think to question him. Ms. McCarthy, when you first joined the EPA, did senior officials tell you that Mr. Bill worked for the CIA? I was led to believe that he did, yes. And uh, during your tenure as Assistant Administrator of Air and Radiation, were you unhappy with the fact that Mr. Bill was spending so much time supposedly working for the CIA? I was, sir. I did my best to get him back to EPA so we could utilize our, our Federal funds as, as, as appropriately as we could, recognizing at that point that I thought he had obligations to another agency as well. Uh, during uh, this committee's deposition of Mr. Bill in December 2013, Mr. Bill stated that you, you halted his work on a project he started in 2005 under one previous assistant administrator and supported by two more after that. Mr. Bill stated during his deposition that you asked him to stop working on that project, come back to working full time and resume his position at the Office of Air and Radiation. Is that true? My main goal was to get him back to EPA for as many hours as I possibly could, and I think his deposition might indicate that I was a bit of a pest about that. Uh, but I am glad I was. It, it led to a referral to the OIG, and they did a great job with DOJ in, sure. in putting him in jail and getting back Federal funds that belonged to the, to the public. And, and just, just to, uh, for the, for the uh, committee's sake, uh, Bill said that you uh, told him things were so busy that we just cannot afford having somebody out there doing an academic project and we need all hands on deck. Is that accurate? That is correct. Administrator McCarthy, the plea agreement that Mr. Bill signed with the U.S. Attorney's Office only covered his fraudulent actions from 2000 to 2013. I believe there must be unauthorized bonuses and travel expenses that the Federal Government and American taxpayers paid, which Mr. Bill was, has not given back. Do you agree? Yes, I do. And is EPA making efforts to collect these additional monies from Mr. Bill? EPA is continuing to uh, seek additional reimbursement and restitution, um, as well as taking steps to reduce his retirement annuity. We are attempting to get back everything uh, that this uh, convicted felon fraudulently took from the United States of America. And he is still el eligible for his retirement? Well, he is. Uh, as far as I know, that is what the law indicates. Um, even if we had successfully fired him, he would still be eligible re for retirement. I wonder if he gets one from the CIA. <laughs> I am not sure he is spending it in the uh, place where he would choose, but uh, he has it. You know, um, during this committee's interview in, in March uh, with Mr. Hooks, the Assistant Administrator for the Office of Administration and Resources Management, he told us that you sought his assistance with Mr. Bill in December of 2010 or January of 2011. I understand that personnel issues are within Mr. Hooks's uh, portfolio. Is that correct? Uh, I, I did, yes. And he stated that you were frustrated that EPA was paying for Mr. Bill's salary when he was supposedly working 100 percent for the CIA. He said you wanted Mr. Bill back doing work for you. He also said you were concerned that his, his retention bonuses were not recertified and that he was being paid over the statutory limit. Is that correct? That is correct. And, uh, Mr. Chairman, I see that my time has expired and I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Now I recognize myself for five minutes. Thank you for being here. Uh, Madam Administrator, um, you say that you are cooperating with the Office of Inspector General. In July of 2013, uh, they highlighted to Congress that you had not issued an all-hands uh, memorandum to your employees encouraging them to participate. Why not do that? Uh, I, I actually uh, was a bit appalled to think that I had to send out a memo on one particular legal obligation or my expectations to staff. And I knew that there were a lot of challenges uh, they were facing in terms of updating our systems. Are you going to do that? Are you going to issue an all-hands 
a memorandum to I'm your sorry, employees? I'll, I'll answer more quickly. I actually, instead of doing a memo, I did an all-hands video and speech where we talked about both accountability, I'll ask you where I confirmed our, our, my expectation that people would be accountable and that the OIG I was important and should be fully fully brought in to any issues. I, I think to satisfy the OIG's concerns, to issue a memorandum, to make it clear to employees to help participate would be much appreciated. I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record the June 13, 2014 letter from Chairman Issa and uh, Senator Vitter. Sir, to can this I just effect. point out that I send a lot of mass mailers out. I do very Without few town hall order. meetings, and that's what I did this town hall meeting to actually impress upon. It obviously didn't satisfy their concerns. Let me ask you, prior to your being named the administrator, you were, the, my understanding is, the assistant administrator of the Office of Air and Radiation from 2009 to 2013, correct? Yes. And how, during that time, it is my understanding that you had three people that were direct reports to you, uh, correct? It, I actually had quite a few more than that, sir. How many direct reports to you? Um, let me look. I had probably 10 or so, okay. actually so you had uh, 11, 12, something like that. A dozen or slightly less than. Um, is it against Department policy to view pornography on official work computers during official time? Yes. What is the consequence if, you're get, if you get caught doing that? You, you either take criminal or, enforce, or administrative action or both. Can you be fired? Uh, yes, you can. We have three instances here where, for instance, we have a GS-14 EP employee within the Office of Air and Radiation, something that you oversaw, who had been accused of viewing pornography two to six hours a day since 2010. This person is on administrative leave with pay. Why didn't you fire this person? Uh, I actually have to work through the administrative process, as you know, and there is still an ongoing OIG criminal investigation, is my understanding. We, we have actually banned him from the building. He no longer has access to any EPA equipment, but administrative leave is We have another person at the EPA at within point. the Office of Policy who admitted, they have admitted viewing pornography while at work for at least two hours at a time. You have another person, an EPA employee at the Chicago Regional Office who had child pornography files on his work computer and viewed them on a regular basis. Actually, that gentleman was fired and, and was, was actually put in prison. I just don't understand why, at one point, the OIG walks into the office, they are actually viewing pornography when they walk into the office, and that person has not been fired. I don't understand. Well, we just had an exchange with the chairman that, that I would like to point out, which is any way that we can make these processes move more quickly, I am all for it. But there is an administrative process we must follow, because it is one thing to get upset, it is a second thing to successfully go through both criminal and administrative procedures to, to address the issue and, and, in a And I think that is something we are going to have to address, because why these people aren't fired on the spot, I just do not I know. would welcome Congress taking up some of those challenges. It would be great. And, and I also, with all due respect, need to understand why you had issued a memo. This is an, a, a, an email that you sent on uh, March 29th of 2012. This gets into knowing when John Beale was a problem. I mean, at one point you say, quote, I thought he had already retired, and yet he continued on the payroll for some time. You knew about his issues with his payroll problems and his other things for years, and you didn't do anything about it. In fact, your own agency and, de and, and uh, department here issued this uh, report saying, from the beginning of 2001, it appears Mr. Beale began not to appear in the office as much as one day per week, although he was not approved to leave. Second, Beginning in mid-2000s, Mr. Beale began not to appear in the office for more lengthy periods of time. According to the EPA's Office of Inspector General, those abuses ranged from weeks to several months in the mid-2000s to the end of Mr. Beale's career. Well, he didn't even appear at work. He's one of your less than 12 employees. Why isn't he fired at that point? If he doesn't show up to work for months, did you not know that? I think that we have discussed the fact that it was my understanding from day one that he had obligations to other agencies as well. I did the best that I could. 
um, do, to try to keep my, track my last of question him to and the to bring him to justice. And frankly, I am very appreciative of the work of the OIG and DOJ to actually do Why did it that. take you so long? The OIG said it took them one week to figure it out. You knew it was a problem for years and you didn't think to call or ask anybody? Why is it that the OIG Actually, could I find did, it out in one week? I did refer to the OIG when I had the information available to me that I had been requesting for quite some time and working diligently. You referred to it to the general counsel. You did not refer it to the OIG, which you were supposed to do. I'm and sorry, you got promoted so because correct. of all this. That's not correct. I actually referred it as a, as a human re, uh, resources issue to OARM, which is our office that handles that. It became clear that there were other issues involved. They referred it to OHS to do some communication through the intelligence agencies because there are liaison. When information was understood that this was more than a time and attendance issue, then it was referred to the OIG appropriately. Well, this was a time and attendance issue and other things. We will, we will spend some more time on this issue. Um, okay. My time is well past and, and, and expired. I believe we now have to uh, we'll go to Mr. Tierney now from Massachusetts. Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I, th I think perhaps you, uh, you want to go to somebody else. I am fine with that. Ms. McCarthy, how are you? <laughs> I like the way you say my name, sir. <laughs> McCarthy, we get. <laughs> well, hey, I, I can do it too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so look, uh, thanks for throwing out the first pitch, for the Red Sox this year. We uh, got some more work to go on that, but I did better than Fifty Cent. You did. You did. You, did. <laughs> you like the way I said that? Nick? I like that the way you said that as well. Uh, like, like I want to shift gears a little bit here because I think there are some important things being done uh, that we have to talk about here. One is the, uh, the Clean Power Plan that EPA put out. It really has the potential to drive technological innovation in the clean energy and energy efficient technologies. I think that is critical on that, and I am sure you will agree. It is going to be a huge benefit to our economy, uh, especially on the long term, but also in the more recent term. So one of the elements of that proposal is the options for States to use electricity more efficiently. Mm. Uh, you base or the agency bases proposal on what States are already doing uh, to implement energy efficiency measures. I want to ask you to tell us a little bit more about the best performing measures that States are already using to improve energy efficiency and reduce electricity demand. Well, what is most exciting about this is the fact that States and cities, I was just at the U.S. Conference of Mayors, and they know they have been dealing with these issues for a while, and they have developed a, a bunch of uh, different techniques that can address, that can address uh, carbon pollution and put people, money in people's pocketbooks. So they are pretty excited, as am I. Uh, there are energy efficiency initiatives that can be brought to the table. I think you will know from Massachusetts that they have a robust energy efficiency program. They also have a renewable fuel standard program. They have been a leader in energy efficiency, and I am proud to say, for years. And, and they also are participating in the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, because the other flexibility that we allowed in this proposal to States is not just go it alone, but if you want to join with other States or work on regional initiatives so that you get better reductions for your money, that, that's wide open to you. So I think this will indeed spark innovation in renewables and energy efficiency technologies, will be a leader in 21st century uh, energy uh, uh, generation, and I am pretty, pretty pumped. And are you working to make sure that other States have the advantage of knowing what the best practices are in those States that are really aggressive in those areas? We are, actually. If you take a look at this proposal, we, we give examples of, of State leadership here that others can work from. We also are meeting with States and energy officials and environmental officials from those States so that everybody gets to see what the best practices are that they can take advantage of, especially the efficiency ones, which pay off for everybody consistently. It is just a way of getting pollution reduction that's, that is, that is uh, sustainable. And that is what we are really looking for here, because you can continue to grow the economy while you cut those pollution levels down. That is what EPA does. Well, look, I, I, in my district, I know people are talking about jobs, and I suspect it is not different elsewhere on that. So talk to us a little bit about the number of jobs that could be created by making these kind of investments on that, and you know, just how we are going to boost the economy that way. 
Well, we know that this will actually create uh, thousands of jobs, and those jobs are going to be created in the clean energy economy. We are talking about jobs related to both renewable energy as well as the wealth of energy efficiency programs. If you are heavily reliant on coal, it also can be expenditures that you make at those facilities to deliver that energy more efficiently. So there's a lot of choices that, that states get to make here. We wanted to take each state where they were so that this wasn't an attempt to preclude any uh, uh, generation from being utilized effectively, but it is to open up the table to all kinds of new choices to states. Did you find any parts jobs. of the country that didn't have a potential to boost their uh, use of cleaner energy? Well, one of the reasons we did individual state standards and then allowed the states to develop the own, uh, own plans as a proposal uh, was because we recognized that each state was in a different place. So some have looked at that kind of funny. If you look at percentages, you will see that, that West Virginia, which, which emits a considerable amount of carbon from their coal-based um, system, they have a little bit less percentage reduction because their opportunities aren't as great for inexpensive reductions, where you have the State of Washington that does very well and we are asking a large percentage. We just looked at what they were doing anyways, where they were. This is not a stretch goal for any State. It is an opportunity to turn climate risk into business opportunity, job growth and economic growth. It, it seems pretty clear that, that you are giving incentive to States to put in more solar panels, to erect yeah. more wind turbines, weather more homes, install more energy efficient appliances and machinery. I mean, this is the direction that we are heading. These are jobs that pay well. Uh, they can't be exported. They are here to stay. Is that right? That is exactly right. Okay. So I just think that you are heading in the right direction here. I think for not only for the clean air aspect of it uh, and all the other economic and even national security interests you are talking about, but the jobs, jobs, jobs part of it on that and the allowance of states that the flexibility to innovate uh, and do it in the way that means most sense to them. I thank you and the agency for your hard work in that regard, and I yield back my time. Thank you, sir. I thank the gentleman from Massachusetts. The chair recognizes the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry. I thank the gentleman from North Carolina. And, uh, Administrator McCarthy, I, I thank you for, uh, for being here today. Um, and uh, I, I certainly appreciate uh, your willingness to answer questions. I want to ask you about a Superfund site in my district, in Buncombe County, uh, Region 4. Um, and uh, there is TCE contamination. Um, and, you know, TCE is often called sinker, right? And what we found with studies and what I have been told from the experts is that this TCE contamination is also a floater because there is a petroleum element to it, and so it is on the, on the surface of, of the groundwater. So, therefore, it, th finding that out is a, is a positive thing, because it, it, um, it makes the cleanup easier and means that we can actually take action now. And so that is what I want to ask you about, is, um, is about that very issue. And uh, the EPA uh, can require CTS, which is the company uh, that did the polluting, uh, to move forward immediately to address the floating contamination while it, it continues to invest, uh, in, investigate the sinker contamination. Will the EPA urge CTS and direct them to do that? Well, I, I don't know, uh, sir, what the next step is. I do know that progress is being made, and I really appreciate your interest in this site. This is actually a site that can significantly impact public health. Um, and so I, I think it is important that we keep moving this forward. I am glad it has been listed on the Superfund list, finally, um, so that we can move it forward. And our next steps are, are actually to conduct some follow-up air sampling uh, studies to define the extent of the contamination in the air and in nearby homes, which is something that I think uh, you have been very focused on. Uh, and the study will expand um, uh, and move away from uh, the site so we can identify the full extent of the release of the volatile organic compounds. Um, and we can properly address both the immediate public health challenge as well as the environmental cleanup challenge. So this has been challenge. 20 years in the making, long before you and I had our current yeah. roles and long before Congressman Meadows and I represented this county. Uh, we have only represented this county for 18 months. But what we need is action from you. And what we, from what we understand from CTS officials, and my constituents have heard from board members of that company, they said they have asked, and the quote is, they are doing everything that EPA has asked them to do, right? Um, and so there is a credibility problem for the EPA 
at stake here, both on the time frame it took to get this site on the national priorities list, um, as well as uh, that type of message coming from the company. We also know that uh, it, the administrative orders of consent in 04 and 12 uh, say that the EPA has the authority to direct the company in very extraordinary ways. And so uh, I ask you to do that. There is immediate action that can take place that will be good for the public health of my constituents and Congressman Meadows' constituents, good for Western North Carolina, and, and is a meaningful step that can be taken in the short term to clean up what we know is, is achievable, even though the, uh, the more difficult issue may still remain. So what I ask you to do, what I urge you to do, is to work through these issues. And, and deal with that and take action. I would be happy to, to uh, uh, take a look at this. Why don't I make sure that your staff and ours talk about this, and, and I will do the very best I can to make sure that this cleanup addresses both the immediate concerns uh, as well as the long-term uh, pollution issues that we are trying to address. Uh, thank you. I thank you. And we have worked extensively uh, with uh, Region 4 staff. And, look, we all want clean water. We all want clean air. And what, what, uh, what my uh, families that I represent in Western North Carolina want is, is action taken. And so uh, with that, I would like to yield the, the balance of my time to Congressman Meadows on this issue, uh, uh, because uh, he has worked extensively on this, on this matter as well. Um, I, I thank the gentleman. I thank uh, the gentleman from North Carolina. Uh, uh, Congressman Micah would like me to yield just a couple. Well, thank minutes. you, and I'll be very brief. I, I came late, and I'm leaving early. I just like if you could provide to the committee, since it's such a, an important issue, any changes in the definition of wetland. I know by regulation you're uh, you're uh, changing the rules. It's going to have a huge impact. Uh, I have not been happy with any changes from either this committee or the Transportation Committee. If you could provide that timeline uh, to, to the Chair and the committee, I would appreciate it. And, and I ask, in, in reclaiming my time, um, I ask unanimous consent that Congressman Meadows be yielded 50 seconds, uh, since that subject matter didn't have anything to do with a, a water pollution issue we have in, in our district. So, Without, without objection. Ms. McCarthy, I have worked extensively with Congressman McHenry and your office in Region 4. The frustration that I have experienced, uh, if I were to be as passionate as, as the people that I represent this morning, uh, it wouldn't be something that C-SPAN could cover. Uh, the, uh, truly, the inaction of the EPA to protect the health and well-being of the citizens of Buncombe County uh, at best has been thwarted and at worst has been ignored. And uh, it, is, it is incumbent upon the EPA, if the mission is the health and well-being of the citizens, that we get an action plan that not only talks about the short term, but that cleans it up. This is a 25-year problem that still exists today. And cleanup hasn't started. Yeah. So with that, I would uh, recognize Mr. Conley, the gentleman from Virginia. I thank my friend from North Carolina. You know, uh, Ms. McCarthy, I, I, uh, I thought I heard you say earlier to the chairman that um, the subpoena in question subpoenaed all communications regarding congressional inquiries between the White House and the EPA for a five-year period? That is correct. And I think you said that was a pretty wide net. It is a, it's a pretty broad search. Yeah. yeah. Generally, when nets are that wide, what is going on is called a fishing expedition. <laughs> Do I also understand that what is at dispute and why you were threatened with contempt at the beginning of this hearing, which, by the way, makes for an awfully nice headline, and I am sure the press at the press table will be once again accommodating uh, and provide just such a headline, uh, and of course substance with respect to EPA will be set aside or lost in the, in the noise. It is kind of a pattern around here. Get a witness, pillory the witness, interrupt the witness, threaten the witness, tell the witness she or he is not cooperating, interrupt the witness when the witness actually starts to have a relevant answer to a question 
and focus often on the extraneous to make sure, however important that extraneous might be in its own right, but to make sure that we are not actually talking about something of substance like global warming. Uh, in fact, a warning at the beginning of this hearing that it is not about global warming. <laughs> after one of the most momentous regulatory decisions in the history of the EPA and after a very interesting Supreme Court ruling, which I want to talk to you about this week. So I am sorry, you are getting the treatment. It is par for the course. We have done it, unfortunately, uh, with a lot of consistency for the last four years. It is not pretty. Um, Ms. My friend, uh, uh, Jackie Spear uh, read into the record yesterday, even the Speaker, Speaker Boehner, warning that witnesses coming before committees here in Congress need to be treated with respect. Um, and I, I find it really interesting, by the way, that we would also, some of us apparently would focus on uh, people who have uh, obviously abused and misused their position at the EPA by watching pornography or engaging in other things that are illegal or certainly inappropriate. You know, it was just announced yesterday that a chief of staff to a member of the Congress, a Republican member, had to resign after it was revealed he had had a long-term affair with a porn star and had inappropriate pictures of his physique posted. Um, and we have members of Congress who have been in the books of madams of brothels. We have had members of Congress selling or buying cocaine. We have had, you know, uh, we have our own peccadillos, and we can focus on those, too. And maybe we need a special prosecutor, or maybe we need to be investigated uh, as to how long did we know, and whether government property was used, and whether when somebody learned of it, they appropriately responded in a relevant period of time. I say Congress itself is hardly clean here. And that doesn't mean we want to in any way, shape, or form condone inappropriate activity. But to somehow pretend in our questioning that it is unique to you and to the EPA is really a bit much. If I may ask, uh, in the time limited, about uh, Justice Scalia's opinion this last week. Um, the Court, uh, is it fair to say that the endangerment finding is now settled law after that? After that ruling, from I your don't point? want to speak as a lawyer, sir, but uh, seems pretty settled to me. Yes, the court did nothing to roll back the landmark decision in 2007 that EPA has the authority to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. Um, would we maybe agree that EPA's authority to regulate green, regulate greenhouse gas emissions is now settled law based on that opinion? Certainly appears that way to me, sir. Uh, the Court was looking specifically at EPA's program for regulating carbon pollution from large new industrial facilities. The Court took issue with the EPA's legal approach, but basically came to very near to the same result in terms of which facilities could be regulated. Is that your understanding? It basically confirmed what we are already doing, yes. Justice Scalia reportedly said in announcing the opinion, it bears mention that EPA is getting almost everything it wanted in the case. It sought to regulate sources that it said were responsible for 86 percent of all greenhouse gases emitted from stationary sources. Under our holdings, EPA will be able to regulate sources responsible for 83 percent. Do you believe the Supreme Court's decision validates your efforts to responsibly regulate carbon emissions from large new facilities? Oh, very much so. Does anything in the Court's decision last week, or this week really, impact your authority to cut carbon emissions from existing power plants? No, sir. It is a confirmation that EPA has been on the right track and that the Clean Air Act is an appropriate tool and that we can use it wisely and effectively. And um, how many members of the Supreme Court joined Justice Scalia's opinion in that ruling? Seven to two, sir. Seven to two. So for decisive opinion by the Supreme Court validating your role uh, and the regulation just issued. I thank, uh, I thank the Chair, and I thank you, Ms. McCarthy, for your service to your country. By the way, where in Boston do you come from? I actually live in Jamaica Plain. Jamaica Plain. Yes. All right. I was born My family is in West Roxbury, and I can talk like that, too. And I love oh. the Red Sox. They are wicked good, and I am hoping I, they I win again. I thank the gentleman thank from the Virginia. <laughs> uh, needing no translator, we will go to the gentleman <laughs> from Ohio. <laughs> I thank the Chairman. Ms. McCarthy, when do you think the American people can expect a decision? And I understand your agency is not the agency that ultimately decides, although you are 
pretty, pretty heavily involved. When do you think the American people can expect a decision on the Keystone Pipeline? Uh, my understanding is that there are certain issues with the location of the pipeline that needs to be resolved, so do, I cannot anticipate do you, that. Do you, do you know when the application for the Keystone Pipeline was, was uh, first submitted? No, I do not. September 2008, mm -hmm. almost six years ago. Um, you are familiar with the fact that the Governor said he is fine with the Governor of Nebraska said he is fine with the new proposed route? It is not my decision, sir. But, but don't you have a critical part in, in, in the ultimate decision? Didn't you guys do an environmental uh, impact report uh, from your agency which said there is no significant impacts to have this pipeline uh, come to the United States? Actually, EPA's role is, is to comment on that impact report. It actually was developed by the Department of State. And you guys gave it a thumbs up, isn't that correct? Uh, EPA has just provided comments. We have no authority to do up or down on this and, one. And your comments were clear back in 2011. It's my understanding August 2011 is when you gave the comments that there is no significant impact, no significant environmental impact. Uh, it is not clear to me that that was a comment. Do you have any EPA. conversations with the State Department since that August 26, 2011 report where you said no significant environmental impacts? Have you had conversations with the State Department about the Keystone Pipeline? Do you know if your I, agency I, has? I personally have not. Um, we have staff that in have your been time, working In your time at this. the agency, have you had conversations with the uh, State Department about the Keystone Pipeline? Um, I may have. Have you had conversations with the White House about the Keystone Pipeline? Yes. How recently? Oh, uh, we received information uh, on the Keystone Pipeline uh, when, when the, the uh, pipeline issue um, and, and the route question arose, and they actually sent a memo to us indicating that we should hold off on, on submitting our comments. I think that was probably four months ago or so. So in, in, in the past four months, since that time, have you had any conversation with the White House and, uh, and or the State Department regarding the Keystone Pipeline? Not that I can recall. No conversation in the last four months with either the White House or the State Department? Not that I can recall. Do you, how long do you think is appropriate for a decision to take? Uh, is, is, is six years too long, too short? I mean, is there, can you hazard a guess at, at what point the administration is going to say, okay, six years is long enough, we have studied this long, we have got to make a decision? When, 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 I mean, how long do you think is appropriate time frame? There is no timeline, sir. There is no timeline? So this not could take, do you think it is okay if it took eight years? It is not a, a project that I, I am proposing. I am asking your opinion, comment. though, as the head of the, the whole issue has been the environmental concerns. You head the Environmental Protection Agency. I am saying is eight years okay to wait after, after an application has been there submitted? There is no timeline, sir. Ten years would be okay? There is no timeline. So it, it could forever. I mean, it could take 20, 30 years and that would be fine. It is a, it's a project that, that goes through its, its own uh, and, uh, its own uh, work to get the project developed. It goes through a, a, an impact statement development, EPA comments. We have nothing more to do with it other than a commenter on somebody else's project that is being evaluated by another agency. Yeah, and you that's said there is no significant environmental impact. And what I am trying to get at is if I do not believe that was actually what we said. We raised is issues of, uh, the, uh, relative to the analysis that we thought could be improved. I think work has been done since then. Uh, just but for the, we just have for the record, one, one, one last thing. Just for the record. So in the last four months, you have had no conversations. There has been no input from the EPA to the White House uh, and or the State Department regarding the approval or some kind of decision made on the Keystone Pipeline application? I think you asked me about my own personal communication since we received the memo that, that we should right. uh, hold off. I have not had personal conversations about this. Well, then let us ask, has your agency had any conversations with the White House, uh, to your knowledge, has your agency had any conversation with the White House or the State Department in the last four months? I do not know the answer to that question, sir. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman from Ohio, and we go to the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Spear. Mr. Chairman, thank you, and thank you, Administrator McCarthy, for being here. And I would like to, at the outset, point out that this committee has made 18 separate committee investigations of the EPA, that in making requests of the EPA, your office has provided 208,000 
documents, that you have testified three times, and that you have sat for a transcribed hearing. So I believe all of that suggests that you are a very compliant witness, that you have been very accommodating to this committee, and that for members to throw around the threat of uh, contempt when there has been this much attention paid by you and your agency to this committee is uh, without merit. Now, your Clean Power Plan has gotten some rave reviews recently, none the least of which is from the Wall Street Journal, which um, says it strikes a balance between environmentalists and utilities in terms of what they all want. Nike and Levi and Starbucks have all commented on how they saw it as valuable. In California, uh, unlike some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle that suggest that curbing carbon dioxide emissions kills jobs, um, California, as you know, has a cap-and-trade environment in which we are operating. Uh, and in the um, last couple of years, we boasted some of the greatest economic turnarounds ever. As long as cap and trade has been in effect, California now ranks in the top 10 states in employment growth and the top 20, for the top 20 U.S. regions for job growth. So I, I think in California we believe that you, have, you can have a healthy economy and a healthy uh, environment as well. So my question to you, with the understanding that the Government Accountability Office considers climate change to be a high risk to taxpayers, it appears we have just a, a, an outstanding responsibility to address it. Would you tell us what you believe the relative costs and benefits of the EPA's proposed rule on existing power plants is? I am happy to do that. And, and I, I think I would just point out that the President indicates that this is a moral obligation to act, and, and I could agree the Pope. with him more. Um, the, the power plant rule uh, that we put out, the proposal, um, looks at a $55 billion to $93 billion a year in benefits uh, in 2030 alone, um, which far outweighs the costs that are estimated at $7.3 billion to $8.8 .8 billion. This is clearly a winning opportunity, uh, not just in terms of a cost-benefit analysis for today, but in terms of the future it will provide for our children. And this is all about public health. It is all about protecting our children um, and keeping our communities safe today. Uh, in fact, your reference to public health is worth uh, restating. I am told that anywhere between 2,700 people uh, to 6,600 on the high end are not going to be subject to dying prematurely because of this plan, and that between 140,000 and 150,000 children uh, will not have asthma attacks as a result. Let me uh, shift gears for a minute. In an interchange with one of my colleagues who somehow objected to the fact that you didn't go immediately to the Inspector General on the Beal case, um, you indicated that you went first to the Office of General Counsel. Can you explain to us why you did that? Well, uh, originally, uh, uh, my understanding and my goal was to, to make sure that he was appropriately utilizing his time, whether it was with us or with another agency. When I had concerns about him not being at EPA, as well as concerns about whether or not he was effectively working for another agency, I Can brought Can we say it, what the other agency oh, yeah, is? I, think I it's believe a, it's the Central Intelligence Agency. All right. Agency. So yes. that's why there was some... Yeah. And, and so I brought it, the, the, but at that point in time, I did not know that that arrangement wasn't real. I knew I had a problem. I went to the correct agency. That agency themselves brought in our Office of General Counsel, and they also made a decision to go to our Office of Homeland Security because programmatically it is our liaison with the intelligence community. And the first question was, did he have a relationship and an obligation to an, another entity? And, it, and when that progressed far enough for us to know that we had bigger problems than we originally anticipated, I brought the issue to the Inspector General. 
and ask them to do a thorough investigation. And I have to say, as much as there's questions about whether we support the OIG, is that clearly I do, the agency does. There is a culture of embracing the Office of the Inspector General, knowing that EPA needs to be high performing. Anything less wouldn't do service to the public and to protecting public health and the environment, which is clearly our mission as well as our passion. Thank you for your leadership. I yield back. I thank the gentlewoman from California. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Wahlberg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. McCarthy, um, in EPA's recent uh, proposed rule to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, uh, each State has a different target for emission reductions. That is right. That is correct. Uh, the target was determined by analyzing four criteria, as I understand it, one of which was demand-side energy efficiency programs. What does demand-side energy efficient program mean? Well, ba basically it means looking at opportunities for consumers to retrofit their homes, to buy more energy efficient um, uh, um, appliances. It is everything you can do to reduce energy demand, which reduces draw on fossil fuel energy, which in turn reduces carbon pollution. But my follow-up would be, uh, EPA does not does not have the authority to directly regulate demand-side efficiency programs, uh, does it? Well, actually, we are not doing that with this rule, sir. We are actually uh, regulating the pollution from the fossil fuel It, it doesn't appear that facility. way. I mean, the, the fact is, in establishing those subjective criteria for each State, you are attempting to regulate demand-side. Hmm. I, I mean, it, it yeah. <laughs> the I, facts I are the facts. Yeah, I can understand where, where you would look at it that way. And actually, we have specifically called out this issue in the rule itself. We are doing here what States actually asked us to do, was to allow them maximum flexibility to design their own plans on the basis of what they could do to reduce carbon pollution at the source, but directly, which is what we're But directly pushing demand side. Let me, let me no go way. on. Uh, EPA has said the, the rule will not increase the cost of electricity, but under this proposed rule, the cost of electricity per kilowatt hour will actually increase. Isn't that correct? Well, we have indicated that, that the, the monthly cost uh, of electricity um, at its peak will, will be somewhere around the gallon of milk cost. Um, but we also recognize that when demand side reduction is used, which is the easiest, quickest, and usually the preferred approach of States, um, that it actually reduces the bill itself. Because but it reduces it, it reduces it based upon Americans using electri uh, less electricity, not the fact that the cost of, uh, of electricity goes down, but making it impossible for Americans to use electricity as they ought to be allowed to use Actually, electricity. Actually, the amount, the amount of increase in the rates is, is, is well within the range of fluctuation that we have been seeing. And so we are quite convinced through scarcity, that this is Through scarcity. That is happening in my district. I am sorry? Uh, that is through scarcity. The push is to reduce electricity by saying to the consumer, don't lose, use electricity. It is not no. by reducing the cost of production of it. It is actually by providing them more opportunities to reduce waste, uh, which I think Well, does, does, the, does the Clean Air Act give EPA the authority to regulate American electricity consumption? We are not suggesting that we do regulate that. We're, we are regulating pollution, pollution at the source. Well, now that I got that off my chest, because I, you know, we are entitled to our opinions, but not to the facts. And the facts are very much different than that when we are pushing consumption as the issue. And in America, that isn't the normal way of doing it. Let me, let me go back to some of the administration questions uh, that, that I have concern with. Uh, does Beth Craig, who served as a uh, former Deputy Assistant Administrator in the EPA's Office of Air and, uh, and Radiation. Does she still work and receive salary from the EPA? Yes, she does. Um, you, you, of course, we already know from testament are aware uh, that she cost uh, the government by uh, not overseeing um, uh, the special agent man, Mr. Beal, at least $200,000 of cost to the taxpayers that were fraudulent. In, in a um, uh, your, your agency's website, it says, uh, to meet our mission as a high-performing organization, EPA must maintain and attract the workforce of the future, modernize our business practices, and take advantage of new tools and technologies. 
Can you explain how Beth Craig, a current EPA director uh, who has cost the government nearly $200,000, is part of the workforce of the future? Well, I, I want to first point out, sir, that, that there is no indication, and the OIG has confirmed this, there is no evidence that she actually contributed to any fraudulent activity or she, she was involved in any. Now, clearly, Beth Craig is now uh, being looked at uh, in terms of whether or not she diligently looked at time and attention sheets and travel. That administrative process is proceeding. The OIG confirmed $200,000. And her management of that, her administration of that, allowed that to happen over the course of yep. over a decade. Whether and, or not Beth did, and she's still being played, paid paid by the taxpayer. Worked. And if that's the if that's the workforce of the future, well, she's not been accused of any fraudulent activity. The question was whether she was. And I guess the, the question. In that and I'm over time. I yield. I yield back. But the question is, why not? I thank the gentleman from Michigan, and uh, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Arizona, Dr. Gozar. Thank you very much. Uh, Administrator McCarthy, in August 2011, President Obama acknowledged in a letter to Speaker Boehner that seven new proposed regulations would each cost the economy at least a billion dollars annually. In fact, out of those seven, four of those regulations were put forth by the EPA. I repeat, four. Um, how many new regulations has the EPA pre proposed this year that will cost the economy at least a billion dollars annually? I don't have that figure, sir. Can you provide those names and those numbers and estimates to of the course. committee? Now, as you know, Congress has repeatedly rejected previous cap and tax energy plans proposed by the President and his big government allies. Knowing he can lawfully enact a carbon tax plan, he can't. He has instructed you to circumvent Congress and oppose these new regulations by fiat. Do you believe the, AP, the EPA should follow the intent of Congress when implementing new regulations? I believe that EPA is actually following the law that, that Congress enacted in a way that we are supposed to implement, and I think that has been, been confirmed by the Supreme Court every time it has been asked of I, them relative to carbon pollution. I, I, 83 percent, and so remember that carefully here. And I am glad you bring that up. Um, so will you return the new waters of the U.S. proposed rule to your agency in order to address the legal, scientific, and economic deficiencies of that proposal? So, I am sorry, was there, I didn't understand Let me go. the question. So citing the Supreme Court again, yes. and, and uh, uh, I want to just give you a little background. The Supreme Court has issued four decisions that reinforce the limits of the EPA's jurisdiction and waters of the U.S. Yes. Yep. Um, yet you seem to have another effect that you want to violate this with this current set of rules. So I am asking you, so will you return the new waters of the U.S. proposed rules to your agencies to address the legal, the scientific and economic deficiencies of your proposal? Well, it is, a, it is out for public comment now, sir, and it was specifically put out in order to address the concerns raised by the Supreme Court in terms of the jurisdiction Once again, of the Clean Water uh, Act. It has been identified legally with economic deficiencies and scientific deficiencies. Yes, it has. There is four, there's four Supreme Court rulings. You just acknowledged the gentleman from Virginia that the, the Supreme Court had the, the rule of the land. There are four jurisdictions. Uh, from the Supreme Court that limit the EPA and its jurisdiction of the waters of the U.S. Will you return it to your, to your agency? I am happy to have more discussions about this, sir, but the reason we put out the waters of the U.S. was exactly to address the issues that the Supreme Court has put squarely in front I don't, of I, I think I, I don't think that is true. Okay. Um, so, and, and furthermore, David Sundling, the, uh, the founding director of the Berkeley Water Center and professional, professor in the College of Natural Resources of the of the University of California, Berkeley, found major flaws in your agency's economic analysis of waters of the U.S. proposed rule and claimed the errors in the study are so extensive as to render it unusable for determining the true cost of the proposed rule. Once again, uh, does your agency have any plans to correct this flawed economic um, analysis? When well, you sir, put stuff out, you have, to, you have to cede proper information to the public, and you are not. We, we, uh, certainly, we are in a comment period where we will take a look at what 
what might uh, that criticism and, and whether or not it is substantive and how we would address it. We have recently extended the comment period 90 days exactly because we know that this concern is raised about the proposal and we want to provide clear public opportunity to comment on this so we can understand well, the issues that, that have been raised. Well, it is interesting that you are doing that, but you have to provide the public proper information, and this is completely flawed. Now, I got limited time. Okay. Your greenhouse gas rule proposed to threaten the close of the Navajo generating station and kill 1,000 jobs in Page, Arizona. Approximately 80 percent of those positions are good paying jobs for Native Americans in a very rural area. Besides being a critical employer of the Navajo generating station provides the power that delivers more than 500 billion gallons of Colorado River water to more than 80 percent of Arizona's population, do you believe, yes or no, that the Navajo generating station should be closed? I have no such belief, no. Okay. Do you share my belief that this power plant is a special situation due to the tribal Indian congressional dialogue trust obligations that were constituted by Congress in directing the, con the construction, the direction, the obligations, water settlements, labor law directives associated with that plant? My understanding of that plant is it is one of the most complicated situations I have so ever had to deal with. So it is fairly unique, yes. It is a very it's unique because of where yes. it sits on yes. tribal land and I the agree. congressional oversight. Yep. So it deserves a special attention instead of what it has been getting lately. Actually, sir, we have been giving it special attention because the, the proposal that we put out on our clean power plan actually didn't speak to the Navajo generating station. We actually left the, the tribal units so that we could do a much more extensive analysis. I understand. There's only three, the, one of which is not. And in the, compact, in, in the trust obligations, mm -hmm. the jurisdiction over the tribes and those contracts is this body here, Congress. Have you directed those conversations with Congress as well? Actually, I don't, I don't know what conversations you are referring to. EPA definitely has been given the obligation to regulate pollution from that facility if we feel like it is necessary for public health. We have actually worked through a lot of tough issues with Navajo Generating Station, working with the Navajos, working with the other tribes that have an interest, the Navajo, uh, the Hopi and the Gila River. We have actually worked very closely with the State Salt River Project. I understand how complicated this issue is. We have worked through some pretty big challenges in creative ways, and I am sure we can work through this when the time comes. But we have not yet proposed any regulation well, and of I carbon would, pollution I, from I that would, facility. I would caution the lady that there is also another jurisdictional aptitude, and this is this body, this body of Congress that oversees the trust obligations of the tribal entities, and that has not occurred. So FYI, include us. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much. Mr. Collins is next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for uh, being here this morning. I thought it was uh, a lot of management issues at EPA, which has been discussed, and I know there is a lot more of oversight from, from basically John P Bill to Pebble Mine to employees not being fired for watching pornography, all these other issues we go in. But, but I am going to really take another step and, and continue, uh, take my five minutes and, and sort of continue some of the conversations you just had but from a, a different perspective, from Northeast Georgia perspective, yep. um, about the Clean Water Act and affecting the waters of the United uh, States. The rule would vastly expand EPA's regulatory jurisdiction and in turn would impede businesses and families in Georgia's ninth congressional district and across the country. If this rule is allowed to go into effect, basically dry ditches, rainwater runoffs, low-lying areas, and seemingly any area that would hold water would be subject to EPA's jurisdiction. This would force Northeast Georgia's uh, cattle ranchers to move their herds, chicken farmers to move their chicken houses, and average citizens to consult EPA for permission to build on their land. Actually, it takes it a step further, and I think this is the concern that I have, and not just the production being done now, but in many of my areas, my farmers, my grandparents who dairy farm, some of this, and I know there is an example just down the road from my uh, from where I live where a gentleman has 100 acres of land. Most of it grew up in dry gulches like we most know, but under these kind of rules basically would make his land unsellable because of this process. And this is a very real concern uh, to what we have. So do you really, I uh, just question, Administrator, do you have a dollar value on the impact this proposed rule would have? Any kind of a guess? Actually, I, I, I do not believe there was an economic analysis associated with this because it is a jurisdictional question. But I would point out, and I am happy to have further conversations in Georgia about this, I, we have done, I think, a very good job at trying to not just recognize the exemptions 
that exist in the Clean Water Act relative to agriculture, but to try to expand those in this, and to not write this in a way would, that would expand the jurisdiction of the Clean Water Act, and in fact try to make that narrower on the basis of real science. So I do think there is a large gap between our intent and I think how we wrote it and how it is being perceived, and EPA has a big job to do to close that gap. Well, and I think what you, you, you stated here is, is the dialogue that goes on that I have all the time with, with our constituents that I have been facing yeah. myself. And, and I think it goes back to also to an issue here of, and you talked about a cost and not a, it's a jurisdictional issue, not a cost issue. Well, I think that is the problem that we are having right now is that there is regulation after regulation or jurisdictional yeah. fights, whatever you want to call it. But yeah. the bottom line is it affects the taxpayers, it affects the people who fund the government who want to say, why is government so affecting in my life, especially in areas in which they, frankly, to, and for some of our, even given some of the uh, Supreme Court rulings, there is an overreach here. I do believe there is a, a balance between carrying out your role as a, an administrator and then also balancing the intent of Congress. And I think it goes to Congress being not very good at giving yeah. you direction. I, 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 I appreciate your concerns, and, and the, the more that we could actually talk and even meet with your constituents to understand where we sh it feels like two ships passing in the night, and I need to bring those together, and we have to have a better understanding, and I am entirely open to comment on this. That is well, why gonna, we extended gonna, the comment. We're gonna have, I got a couple of quick questions in that I, need to just, I would like to get in. Under the proposed rule, it is understood that farmers will only qualify for Section 404 exemptions if they meet national resources conservation uh, and RSCS standards that are currently optional. Yes or no, is that true or false? No, it is not. It is false. Okay. Under uh, current law, would a farmer be required to be NRCS compliant in order to be exempted? No. But they have to currently. So no. If a farmer or rancher has questions on how this rule would affect their property or, or operation, how does the EPA respond to these questions? We work collaboratively, usually with USDA and the farmer, to understand what their concerns are and to address them so they can continue to farm appropriately. What is the average response time? Oh, I don't have an answer to that, sir. If the EPA, if you don't respond in a timely manner, is that farmer or rancher protected from fines or punitive actions by the EPA if they are not in compliance? Could I just clarify one thing? Go is, ahead. is EPA is often not the permitting entity here, so it is very often a State or, or Army Corps. So well, I think that you have also yeah. you've hit something for me perfectly. I believe this is more of a State issue and not yeah. a National EPA issue. We have a, just probably a fundamental difference in National, uh, in fact, EPA exposure and that states are doing some of this. And I think you, you perfectly hit it for me. And you, but we just honestly disagree. I actually don't think we have any disagreement philosophically yeah, I think or hopefully in how we do this rule. Except maybe in the fact that I don't believe your position should even exist. I think the Well, that may be a out. difference. Between now we will have an interesting issue. Um, but I just want you to know. It might we're, be a fundamental difference. That is, well. a, that is a fundamental <laughs> difference at that point. Um, but I have already commented in opposition to this proposed rule. I know that many in Georgia in my district are. But I have one quick question, mm -hmm. and maybe I'll clarify this for me. In your conversation with uh, my good colleague, Ms. Spear, just a moment ago, you, did I hear you say that you went to the CIA first? No, I never talked to the CIA about anything. Not directly, no. Okay. Well, I believe I heard you say that when in, in discussion on the bill that you went to the CIA first. No, what I indicated was I went to our office of, of, that deals with our uh, human resource issues. They actually brought in our Office of General Counsel. They referred this to our Homeland Security Office, which is the liaison with the intelligence community. Okay. They actually communicated with the CIA in seeking verification okay. of whether or not uh, John Beale worked for them in some way and under what circumstances that occurred. Just wanted to make sure for the record that I heard you correctly. Could, Mr. Chairman, could I, I go just, back. Could I just ask, answer one question? I want to make the sure. The time has expired, a, but yes, you can answer. I just want to clarify. When we were talking about the Clean Water Act exemptions, I want I want to make sure that, that I understood your questions, because the Clean Water Act exemptions clearly indicate where there is agricultural exemptions. The additional work that we tried to do with USDA to identify other work that was exempted, um, as long as it is conservation efforts working with USDA, was in addition to those exemptions. And I just wanted to make sure I answered you correctly. And, and I appreciate that. Mr. Okay. Mr. Chairman, if I can have just a moment, because this is the problem. And, and it, it exists because you have people who have real issues and real problems that they and, and they are not transparent. They see EPA from state level or national level. They can't get the answers. And I think this is the problem that that develops around this whole thing. This that we begin we forget the end result. It's not about a building up here in Washington that turns out rules. 
It's about the people in the, that get up every day and want to have their own way to, to do their living and make their life and do so without as, as least interference in the way they can. So with Mr. Chairman, I appreciate it. I also understand that there was an economic analysis done with this rule, so I apologize. We will get that to okay, you. Okay. The time is, time is expired. I thank the gentleman from Georgia, and the chair recognizes uh, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Bentivoglio. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Administrator McCarthy, thank you for being here today. Do you know the current location of former EPA employee Phil North? No, I do not, sir. Administrator McCarthy, are you aware that Mr. North left the country traveling to New Zealand when, his committee had a, when this committee had a pending request to voluntarily attend a transcribed interview? No, sir, I don't know that. Has the EPA produced to the committee all of Mr. North, North's emails since 2002 regarding his work on the Pebble Mine in Bristol Bay? We have, we have uh, uh, submitted all that, that we have identified and we continue to search. Okay. Um, are you aware that the EPA cannot produce all of Mr. North's emails to the committee because his hard drive crashed and the EPA did not back up Mr. North's email? I am aware that, that Mr. North is, uh, was stationed actually in a pretty remote area of Alaska. Um, we are aware and we notified the committee as soon as we are aware that there are some gaps, but, but there, we have already submitted significant amount. So when, it's not clear how much we might have missed, but we're looking at it. Let's see, I got the IRS and the EPA. What is it with bureaucrat, bureaucrats and government agencies when this committee is investigating, trying to find out uh, about their personal emails or emails on an EPA or a government computer, the hard drives crash? Is the EPA in possession of Mr. Norris' failed hard drive? I'm not, I'm not aware. I don't know, sir, but I can find out. Did Mr. North ever receive a bonus? I don't know the answer to that question. How about sir? John Beale, fraudulent CIA EPA employee, get a bonus? Not under my watch. I don't okay. know what happened. You ever? That. I don't know. Okay. Um, Beth Craig, who lied to special agents in, uh, investigating John Beale, get a bonus? Uh, I, I don't know exactly, but. How about the employee who had 7,000? Pornography files on his EPA computer ever receive a bonus? I don't know, sir. Don't know. Ms. Uh, Susan Strassman Sundry, who produced no work in the last five years working from her home, did she ever receive a bonus? I do not know her or the facts of that. Ms. Renee Page, selling jewelry and weight loss products from her EPA office, get a bonus? I do not know the answer to that. Unnamed EPA employee receiving paychecks while in a nursing home for two years. By the way, is he still getting paid? I do not know the answer to that question, sir. I don't know the issue you are I have working class, middle class, or working middle class Americans in my district who are struggling to make ends meet, and employees at the EPA are playing James Bond, watching porno movies on EPA computers, and EPA time, nothing is getting done, they are struggling, and you don't know where your money is being spent. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Duncan. Well, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I think most of us, uh, at least on this side, realize that um, there's more anger and resentment and disgust with the federal government probably today than any time in our history, because almost every day people are reading stories or hearing stories about tremendous, ridiculous waste. Uh, inefficiency, uh, overregulation by the Federal Government. Uh, and also, I think they resent the fact uh, that uh, almost nobody or very few in the bureaucracy have ever spent any time running a small or medium-sized business, and they have no idea or understanding of the pressures, uh, uh, how hurtful it can be to have to lay off people during slow times and things of that nature. But the disgust, I think, probably uh, uh, hit its height when the, they heard and read about an e a high-up EPA official receiving $900,000 over a several-year period for doing no work and even taking paid vacations on the taxpayer dollar. And I want to get back into that just a moment. Uh, the, uh, the, we were given background material that says, um, before the President nominated McCarthy to head the EPA, she served as Assistant Administrator of the Office of Air and Radiation from 2009 to 2013. 
While McCarthy was aware of Beale's frequent absences and lack of work product, she never adjusted Beale's pay or discontinued the unauthorized retention incentive bonuses which made Beale the highest paid employee in OAR during her tenure. And then it goes on, in fact, EPA officials wrote an entire report entitled John Beale Pay Issues in July 2010, which McCarthy was aware of by at least January 2011. Despite recommendations, recommendations to cancel Beale's bonuses, McCarthy halted the internal review and permitted the unauthorized bonuses to continue. Both McCarthy and Bob Parasepi, and I am sure I am mispronouncing that name, attended Brenner and Beale's joint retirement cruise in 2011. And now I am told that, um, uh, and, and we hear um, uh, Ms. McCarthy say that, uh, that uh, Mr. Beale received uh, no bonuses, uh, but we have an email here that I think they have put up on the board there, in which um, this was uh, Ms. McCarthy's response to a Quote, has Craig, uh, Craig uh, that is Craig Hooks, gotten back to you about the pay issue yet? I am eager to move ahead with canceling the bonus. McCarthy replied, no, he hasn't. It is now in his hands as far as I am concerned, showing really a, a hands-off attitude about did no work and who defrauded the taxpayers out of $900,000. And the title of this hearing is Management Failures Oversight of the EPA. And that, uh, I think, shows why this hearing was necessary. But I will tell you, Ms. McCarthy, I am I'm as concerned as I am about that. I am more concerned about something else. Uh, President Obama said a few years ago, he said, under my plan of a cap-and-trade system, electricity rates would necessarily skyrocket, regardless of what I say about whether coal is good or bad, because I am capping greenhouse gases. The, the problem with that is, and we don't, we, we don't have enough people at the EPA, because they have got these high-paying jobs, they don't understand that a lot of people in my district and around the country have, their, have trouble paying their utility bills. And if we triple or quadruple these utility bills, it is going to hurt a lot of poor and lower income and working people. And I don't think the people at the EPA keep that in mind. And I don't think they realize, too, that if you come out with more and more regulations, it helps the big giants. It helps the big, big companies. But it hurts the little guys. We have overregulation by the Federal Government, not only by the EPA, but, uh, but a lot of it by the EPA. A lot of it has run small and medium-sized businesses out of business or forced them to merge or forced them to go to other countries. We have sent millions of good jobs to other countries for the last 40 or 50 years, and we have ended up now with the highest paid waiters and waitresses in the world. And a lot of it, in fact, I think the majority of it is because of environmental overregulation and red tape. Uh, I've, that's, all, that's all I have to say, Mr. Uh, might Chairman. I clarify something, Mr. Chairman? Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to clarify that the bonus issue I, I was answering, I, I didn't realize that they were talking about a retention bonus, and that bonus I did not give. Um, it was actually awarded earlier. It, it continued to be on the payroll. I sought th that to be off the payroll on numerous occasions. Um, and that is one of the issues we are trying to uh, get uh, compensation back. Well, you, you were the head of this OAR in 2009, right? I did. In and 2010. I alerted, my, my understanding. In 2011. That, yeah, my understanding and at that Mr. point. And Mr. Beale was employed by that agency, yeah, the highest paid right, employee yeah. of that agency. Right. During 2009, 2010, yeah. and 2011. It, it was just my recollection that, that when I brought this to his attention, he advised me not to take action because he needed to communicate it to the Office of Inspector General and that I should not alert. Uh, Mr. Beale to any potential investigation. That, that's what that, that email reflected. If the chairman will allow me just one uh, yes. uh, other thing, though, I will tell you this. Johnny Pesky was a real close friend of mine, and he's had me in the dugout at Fenway Park. 
Really? And I was glad a, a few times. And I'm sure if you're a Red Sox fan, you, you've heard of Johnny Pesky. I sure have. <laughs> he was I a sure great have. man. He, he, you and I can at least, spoken, he, at least agree on that. He's breath as Ted Williams, <laughs> and it's, a, it's great. The, Thank you. The gentleman from Tennessee's time has expired. Uh, uh, the, <laughs> the chair would uh, recognize the, the gentlewoman from Wyoming, Ms. Loomis. Thank you and welcome, Ms. Thank McCarthy. Um, we have been waiting, as I understand it, for about seven months for a response about the scientific and other bases for regulations that will increase energy costs on low and middle income Americans, uh, as well as the cost of doing business, and will lead to some job losses, certainly. Uh, and uh, I am curious. Uh, you received a set of science committee questions for the record after you testified last November. Uh, and when will you be responding to those? Uh, actually, if, if this has to do with how science and technology, we did receive a subpoena. We did respond to that, and we believe that issue has been closed out. And could you tell me when that was? Because I am on the science committee as well as this committee. Mm -hmm. Um, these were questions for the record uh, submitted to you on December 17th uh, regarding the peer review process behind the new source performance standards, the integrity of the EPA's ongoing hydraulic fracturing study, okay. uh, revisions to ozone regulations, sue and settle, lack of data transparency and some other. I am sorry. I, I didn't realize that you were asking about questions for the record, which they are in process now. I will get back to you in terms of the timing on responding to those. Okay. I apologize. I didn't realize what you were referring to. Yeah, and I apologize. I am just sort of breezing in That's from okay. another, another right. committee. Uh, these were given to you on December 17, okay. 2013, uh, and uh, were questions for the record. Uh, I am the okay. en Energy Subcommittee. Thank you. I, I will, I'll, I'll look into it and we'll get right back. That would be great. Um, any chance uh, we could hear back by July 14th, about three weeks from now? Right, the, uh, uh, let me see what the status is and we'll get back to you by the end of the day in terms of what we think our, our timeline might be. I have certainly noted that you are interested in having it by then. Thank you very, very much. Uh, another question. Under the EPA's proposed rule to restrict carbon emissions from existing power plants, yes. does the cost per kilowatt hour go up or down? The cost per kilowatt hour by 2030 is estimated um, to go up slightly in some areas. Okay. And those areas are areas that are currently Actually, it depends. We, what, what we do is we look at what kind of response we anticipate states to take. But one of the, one of the issues that we are looking at, and clearly reliability and affordability of the energy supply is one reason why we did this as flexibly as possible with individual state standards and individual plans, was to hear back during the comment period on what states thought, thought was their path forward so we could do a, a good job in the final in estimating those costs. Now, is it true that in order to make the claim that the rule lowers energy costs, the EPA has to rely on an assumption that overall electricity consumption will be reduced? It is actually uh, recognizing that over that period of time, the most cost-effective strategy to achieve the reductions at these fossil fuel plants is to actually look at demand reduction. And that provides an opportunity not just for reduced carbon, but also continued opportunity for economic growth. This is not a cap program. This is an intensity uh, goal. So it doesn't limit the ability to grow economically. It looks at how you produce energy in a way that is as low carbon, less waste, better use of, of low carbon sources. So the if, in order to say that the rule lowers energy costs, yes. uh, you have to assume that consumers will be paying more for electricity per kilowatt hour, but using less power overall. 
We Is don't that have to make that, those assumptions. We are recognizing that there will be some fluctuation in cost. It will be fairly minor over time. But we also recognize that there is a concern about affordability. And if you balance the, the way in which states have to achieve these standards, they could do it in a way that actually lowered bills for people and consumers in the end of this process. Well, I am terribly concerned about how this rule is going to affect consumers in Wyoming. Uh, there are so many uh, uh, middle and lower income yeah. people uh, just trying to make ends meet. And when uh, the cost of electricity goes up over uh, our current coal-fired power plants, most of which are fully depreciated uh, and are being retired prior to the end of their useful life, for example, because of these rules, the Neil Simpson plant at, uh, uh, in, in Campbell County, Wyoming, that its Unit 1 was recently retired fully 10 years before its useful life had expired, and had it been able to uh, carry on for the entirety of its useful life, the consumers in Wyoming would have been able to enjoy lower utility rates. Now it will be replaced by um, a higher cost, brand new plant, and, and hence my concern about uh, uh, the average American well, consumer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I apologize for running over. I thank the gentlewoman from Wyoming. Uh, the chair recognizes himself to uh, ask a few questions, Ms. McCarthy. And as I stated earlier, I could go on and on about CTS, uh, and we would be here long after. It's been a long morning, and so I'm going to. Uh, abbreviate some of those. Uh, Dot Rice and CTS have become a household name in, uh, over the last 13 or 14 months for me. Uh, I, it didn't start on your watch. It didn't start on my watch. But it will finish on our watch. And, and I, I need your assurances that not only will we do additional testing, but that we will get the site cleaned up. Can I have your assurances of that today? Well, that will be, that will be our shared goal, sir. I know that's your goal, but it's been your goal for 25 years that it would get cleaned up and nothing has started. Do we have your assurances that it will get cleaned up? I can't give you a timeline for that, sir. It would, it would be something totally right, out of so my So let me ask you, what is a reasonable amount of time, knowing that the public health is your central focus, it and is. this has been 25 years contaminating the groundwater and air? of people that I represent, how long does it take to come up with an action plan? I don't know in this instance. That it's a, I understand it's complicated, but I also understand your frustration. And why don't we just get together right, and figure so out how, we can, how you can be confident that we're moving with as much, as much speed and as diligently as we can? Okay. Ms. Rice has given me 10 questions that I need answer, answered. If I submit those to you, can you have that back to this committee within the next 30 days? I'll do the very best I can. Okay. So let me go on a little bit further. Today we have talked about the EPA mission and how important it is. So let us look at Superfund sites. There are currently 1,164 sites on the Superfund priority list. Eighty-one percent of those have been there over 20 years, eighty-one percent of them. So we have been dealing with most of those sites for over 20 years. If the EPA is very effective of cleaning up what we know are a priority, because it is a priority list, and it is toxic, many of them toxic, how are we, is it not hypocritical that we continue to pass new rules trying to do something and clean up the air and water when we have known areas that we are not cleaning up? What is the issue? Well, I think we try to uh, address the priorities as they come up. I don't want folks to think that Superfund sites have made no progress that have been in the well, system I, for I, a long I, time. Well, I have got the records. 363 of them have come off of the list out of right. 1,527. That's a up. So well, that is a batting average of 237. Even the Boston Red Sox wouldn't trade a draft pick for that. 
Well, one of the challenges we face is to make sure that we take care of the immediate uh, impacts on public health. One but of the but first you haven't done that do in my when, district. Well, one of the, we need to talk about that. But one of the first things we do at these Superfund sites is to ensure that they are not continuing to pose a health threat. But you didn't do that in my district. To clean it you, up. you know, you have been briefed on mine because they have told me in Region 4 they briefed you before you were coming here today. Well, they sent you, me a couple of pages. You yes. know that that didn't happen. Is that correct? Do I you, know that there has been some immediate effort to take care of some uh, vapor intrusion issues, and I, and I think that that only was in the last, a long, that only was in the long last process. Only in the last 60 yeah. days. We will right. work together. I don't know what to tell okay, you. So you I don't do have I have your commitment today that you will work with me and keep my office informed before you inform the uh, WLOS or any of the others? Yeah. Because I am learning about it from the news media. And I have been working on this for 13 months. Do I have your well, commitment today? We will do our best job to have no support. Do I have your commitment, sir? yes or no? Uh, we will do the best job we can. Okay. So I would take that as a no. No. And the issue that you are referring to, it, it had to do with some private information. No, it did not, Ms. McCarthy. That was my understanding. I know that is what they are telling you. What is private about the EPA going to do a test? It has nothing to do with tax records. It has nothing to do with health. It has to do with our actions. There is no constitutional right to privacy for that, Ms. McCarthy. We, we do everything we can to not surprise the, the folks that, that well, represent Well, I would, I would disagree with you. So I, I let, me, will, let me go on a little bit further. Let me but, tell you we will do better. Okay. I mean, okay. that's, that's, I, I will work hard to do better. I don't want surprises because I know this is an issue you well, care about. Well, it will about. continue to come up serve. until we get it cleaned up. Okay. Okay. So let me go back to the public minds that Mr. Bentivoglio brought up. He brought up this thing about uh, uh, Pebble Mine. Yeah. Oh, yes. In terms of, mm -hmm. of uh, it sounds like we have a missing, another missing hard drive. Is that correct, Ms. McCarthy? Uh, I do not know whether that is the Does case. Does your counsel behind you, I think he is shaking his head yes. Do we have a missing hard drive? Missing? You just turn over. We, we do, uh, I don't believe this is a missing hard drive issue. There is a challenge getting access to the data. So is it a crushed it? hard drive? Uh, what does your counsel tell you? I mean, you, you brought your he counsel here. I assume he's he here to told help me you. We're having trouble getting at the data off of it, and we're trying out the sources to actually supplement that. So, do but you believe you can get the, the data? We're, we're increasingly getting information in different ways, and we're taking a look at it. All right. So, the Federal yes. Records Act came up yes. yesterday in a hearing. Yes. And then I noticed it didn't get brought up today. But it, it looks like the Federal Records Act has been violated by the EPA. Did, did the gentleman that was involved in, in, uh, from Alaska, did he print out his emails? Uh, that is not required, sir. We have did he preserve his emails? That is required by the Federal Records Act. I can't know where the failure uh, occurred. We are talking about a series of emails that where it is not one particular incident. It is an individual that is located in the the, uh, uh, the Nii Peninsula, Kenai Peninsula. So you are saying you can't collect stuff because it is a long ways no, away? No, I am just saying that, that we are we're challenged in terms of trying to figure out where that those small um, uh, failures might have occurred and what, what caused them to occur. But we have produced a lot of information. I, These are I understand. Old I heard documents. very similar testimony yesterday that a lot of documents had been, preserved, uh, had been produced. Have you? You, did, you gave me a great answer to a question I didn't ask. Okay, what's your question then? My question is: directly. Were all his emails preserved according to the Federal Records Act? Were they all uh, well, preserved, or was a law violated? Originally, you asked me if he preserved them. That's what I was. Were they all to. preserved? I think we have notified uh, the appropriate authorities that we may have some emails that we cannot produce. That we should have kept and so we've notified that. I'm not I just aware don't know that you, yet whether we can recover all these or not. So, did you notify the National Archives? Yes, we did. When did you do that? Yesterday. Yeah, after the hearing. Well, it became clear that. So, yesterday that we it became clear that. that you didn't have email. Actually, no. We, we informed the committee when we identified this problem and, and we kept them abreast. And I am in the end not sure whether or not we won't recover all of it. The question I understood you might ask was whether we have already identified, and we did, 
and, and we are where I think we need to be, but I am still hoping that we recover all those emails. And this is not a broad swath of emails over a series of years. These are very selective failures that we haven't yet understood why those records weren't kept, but it appears that people did what they were supposed to do. Okay. So yesterday you informed the National Archives. That is correct. The Federal Record Act actually requires that you would notify them at the time that you notice that you have a problem. So I, I, it was either that you violated the law or today or yesterday you notified them because you saw it on a hearing and you said, oops. No, we notified them without telling them that we have confirmed that there is a problem, but there is a suspicion that we may not be able to locate all of them, and we have properly identified that, and that information. And that happened yesterday? It did. Wow. Okay. Let me go on a little bit further. Uh, really, as we start to look at this, you do know that the IG is, has an investigation looking into I all do. of this. I do, yes. Right. And do you, you also know that we have, uh, the committee has been asking for over two years for these documents, uh, which, uh, many of the documents, uh, you know, requesting additional during the, uh, the subpoenas, investigation during that. We, put, we actually have complied with some earlier requests for information, and we continue to respond as the committee looks for additional information. Okay. Are you aware that, you know, with the EPA, re with regards to a recommended 404 action, uh, yes. kind of the preemptive 404 veto, are you aware that there might have been some collusion that was going on? I, have, I am aware that people have expressed concern about that, and in the, in the, it has been referred to the Inspector General. And does does that it. concern you? Uh, that there I, might I be seen, collusion. I have seen no evidence of it so I, I far. I didn't ask you that. I, I just said, I would it concern you if there was collusion? I am actually happy the Inspector General is looking at this, and I will look forward to his report when it is produced. All right. So if you have a crushed hard drive, are you willing to produce that and give that to the committee as well? Do we have it? We have it, right? Yeah, I, I will be happy to get back to you on that. I, I just want to make sure that I have this right, because the challenge we have been having is, again, that this is, uh, we are not sure where the failure came from and what it is attributed to, but we will be happy to share whatever we have available to the committee. All right. So it sounds like we just have a whole lot of unknowns here as it relates to Pebble Mine, right? Uh, I mean, just well, with all of this going back and forth and investigation, it sounds like there is just a whole lot of uncertainty. Actually, what, what's, what you've or are you certain what's certainty going to about is, is a, a fish biologist who provided input into his expertise on, on Bristol Bay. I think the thing I want to make sure that everybody understands was he's not a decision maker in this process. He inputted into the science assessment that's been fully peer reviewed. We have not made any decision on Bristol Bay. We've just taken a first step, and it will be a fully engaged. Public process. But, but he could have been one of the ones that colluded on this. In fact, there have been uh, innuendos made that he may very well have been the one. Which is why it is important that the Inspector General conduct their investigation at, and that we be, be mindful of the report and we take appropriate action. Well, in light of that, then, yeah. wouldn't you think that it would be prudent to cease the 404C uh, uh, action at this point? until we get all the facts? Well, the, there is no are you we, Are you willing to cease that 404C action until we get the facts? No, sir, I don't. I, I, 